Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Radio Networks. It's about 100 radio stations, 180 radio stations all over the country, and XM channel 166 on Saturday, August 11th, 2012. This is episode 899. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by ShareFile from Citrix. Try ShareFile today. For a 30-day free trial, visit sharefile.com, click the radio microphone, and enter the promo code TECHGUY. Send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile. Sharefile.com. Use the promo code TECHGUY. And by Ford. Ford invites us tech geeks to join the conversation. Submit ideas and grab your tech geek badge at social.ford.com. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about computers, the internet, cell phones, camcorders, MP3 players, home theater, and all that jazz. <laughs> Sold American, 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the uh, phone number. You have a uh, question, a comment, a suggestion. Brand new website, up and running, went flawlessly last weekend. Let's hope it continues this weekend. That's the Tech Guy Labs site, techguylabs.com, techguylabs.com. And uh, we've got uh, James DeRuvo taking show notes. We've got Josh Windish taking show notes. They're going to put everything I say there, even this, even that. And then uh, after we put out the video, because we also, you know, I don't know if you know this, but in addition to broadcasting this show, of course, that's the best way to listen, but if you miss it, we make on-demand versions available in audio and video. And there's a YouTube video. And then we put that on the web page. And then, if all goes well, <laughs> it doesn't work on iOS because of something. I don't get it. For some reason, it doesn't work on iOS. But it works on desktop and it works on a lot of devices. If all goes well, when you click a question and say, oh, yeah, what? Yeah, oh, yeah, so I heard that question. What did Leo say? You, you click on it. It will cue the YouTube video up to that point, And you can... Read my answer. You can watch my answer. And then most importantly, and I encourage you to do this, you can correct my answer. So if you've got an opinion or some experience and you say, oh, you know, Leo, Leo, here, be polite. Say something like, well, Leo's for an old man. Leo got sort of the right answer. He's pretty good for a guy over 25. But let me tell you the actual right. And you something like that. Something polite and gentle. And then you can you could put that in. And and uh, you can even participate by voting on answers, uh, you know, other people's answers. My answer stays. But <laughs> you can, if somebody adds a comment to a question, uh, you can vote it up or down. You just click a little arrow up or down. And then that way, uh, I, I hope over a period of time, the best answers will surface because we'll, we'll, the highest ranking answers are at the top. See what I'm saying there? See what I see what I'm saying there? It's it's a it's a all kind of ties in together. Wow, what a lot to talk about! Did you watch? Uh, boy, you've been watching the Olympics all week, but you know America also won gold on Mars. Did you watch that? That was an amazing gymnastic event. The sky crane lowering a Volkswagen-sized science lab to the surface of Mars on nylon wires, then cutting the cord, flying away to crash elsewhere on Mars. That was cool. That was, I gave that, all the judges scored that a perfect 10. And now Curiosity is walking around, rolling, I don't know, rolling around, I guess, driving around, sending back high-def pictures of the surface of Mars, stereo images, 3D images. Uh, wow, this is just neat. Just neat. I mean, just amazing. Uh and it's interesting because I felt like it didn't get much attention in the in the mainstream media at all. I mean, I guess after the fact it did. But, you know, if you hadn't been paying attention, you might not have even known it was happening. And I realized, I know why that is, because there's no humans on it, right? We're, You know, if they had the Olympics and it was just machines <laughs> doing the shot put, it wouldn't be as interesting. 
So you want, you know, I understand. That's why manned spaceflight grabs the imagination in a way that unmanned spaceflight doesn't. But from a purely technical, scientific point of view, uh, this makes a lot of sense. It's a long way there. It's very expensive. It's a lot harder to get something back than it is to send it there. So send a machine. And this science lab's very sophisticated. Got all sorts of stuff. Instead of sending humans there to collect samples and bring them back to the Earth at a huge expense, send a machine, do the science on the on the planet, and send back the data. It's clever. But I do think eventually you have to send humans, don't you? Otherwise, people just don't get excited about it. I hope people will get excited about this. I was I was actually kind of uh, disappointed in some of the you know the schools around here. I have a friend with a ten year old son, a fourth grader, and did, they didn't talk about it the night the, the week, like on the Friday before. They didn't say anything. Did they talk about it in your school? No. Are you in high school? Yeah. Okay. We have a visitor uh, in the studio, David Joy. He says uh, my school didn't talk about it. I, it seems like that's such an opportunity for a teacher to say, "Hey, you know what we're going to do tonight? <laughs> Guess what?" We're landing on Mars <laughs> with a sky crane. I mean, I think that's an opportunity to get kids excited. They talk a lot about STEM nowadays. This is the hot buzzword in education. Science, technology, engineering, and math. How do we get kids excited about STEM? Well, that way I could think of a better, a better opportunity. I'm sure most schools, I hope most schools did. I was a little disappointed that this fourth grader, I said, are you excited? Michael, are you excited about the Mars landing on Sunday night? He said, what Mars landing? I said, what do you mean? You don't, they didn't talk about this? Said, no. So now, thank goodness for YouTube and NASA. NASA is very sophisticated. In fact, I was totally impressed by NASA's uh, uh, internet. Of course, a bunch of geeks. They have Twitter. Because Curiosity has a Twitter account. You could watch a tweet. Remember Spirit and Opportunity, the other rovers? Remember when, was it Spirit? I think it was Spirit found uh, uh, signs of life on Mars. They found water on Mars. That's what it was. He It tweeted it. It tweeted it on, on the Twitter. That's cool. So NASA understands this. They put beautiful simulation videos. So I went to YouTube and I played the uh, simulation and, and, and he got excited. He said, oh, that's cool. That's neat. You want to stay up late and watch it? Oh, yeah. That's Why aren't they doing that in school? We gotta, we gotta do something about that. There is, I think, unfortunately, I know if it had been manned, they would have, but I think, unfortunately, there is a, there's just kind of this divide now in uh, the U.S. and I don't know, maybe it's global as well, between the people who love and understand technology and people who, like uh, Meredith Vieira on the Olympics opening ceremony, say, "Well, I don't understand any of that stuff. I, it's a mystery to me. I don't really care. LCDs, how do they work? I don't know." And there's a there's a big gulf. Maybe if you listen to the show, uh, you know, uh, maybe you can maybe maybe there are people listening who are getting who are getting excited about this idea, who can get excited about technology. Because I'll tell you what, if you want to, if we want to still be leaders in innovation, if we want to continue to move at the incredibly rapid pace we're moving, um, we better pay attention to science, technology, engineering, and math. That's that's where it all comes from. And the space pro, you know, a lot of what we use in technology today, a lot of our personal computing comes from the space program, comes from the uh, Apollo uh, missions to get a man on the moon. A lot of the computer technology we see today is a result of that. And Velcro, sure, Velcro too, and the space pen, but also computer stuff. Not just, it's not just Velcro. <laughs> it's not just zero gravity toilets. No, there are other things that we get from space. Tang, okay, Tang. There's there's three things we get from space exploration. I just I really think we got to pay attention to this, uh, and it's and it's important. And I think that and I'll tell you the other reason, and one of the reasons I do what I do. Even if you're not going to be an engineer or computer scientist, even if you're not going to launch a mission to Mars, uh, you need to understand technology just from a purely defensive point of view, so you can be intelligent about it. So you can understand it. So you can, you know, uh, protect yourself and also not be a knee jerk about protecting yourself. You know, there's, I get in a big debate all the time over uh, privacy issues on the web. You know, there's certainly you have the right to privacy. I, I agree. I, I know it's not a constitutional right, but it ought to be. And I think you have the right to privacy. Uh, but I think you also have to understand that if you want something free like Facebook, you're going to trade something for that. There's a way 
they're, they're going to need to make some money to pay for those servers and all of that. And so we just need to understand it, and we need to understand what we're giving up and make intelligent choices. Big battle uh, going on right now over uh, it, Microsoft and Internet Explorer 10, the next version of Internet Explorer. First, my, there's this thing called Do Not Track. I don't know if I'm going to have time to explain this. I'm not. <laughs> well, there's my answer. Thank you, Kyle. I'll tell you what. Maybe when we come back, I'm also going to go to the phones. Let's open up the, the phone lines. 8888-ASK-LEO. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Ah. Yeah, uh, you know, but... Remember that uh, that uh, four years ago, uh, Obama picked Vice well, President Biden on the. Uh, didn't he announce it on Twitter? Where did he make the announcement first? Your, Wasn't it an app? Your yeah, we'll mention the value. Romney so pick. Your time, and you can save both with Google Carbon. might hurt Twit Carbon search. Are you talking about uh, the Emmanuel uh, 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 algorithm? Is that what you're talking about? Let me look here. Yeah, that's not going to hurt us. But I think it's reprehensible. You're talking about. This. Google is, in effect, becoming a copyright cop. Thank you. And they say that if a website is dinged for copyright violations, uh, that that website could be penalized in the search results. Um, and I think this is really uh, unfortunate. Sites with high numbers of removal notices may lower our results. But understand, this does not have anything to do with YouTube. In fact, they explicitly exempt their own site, YouTube. And all of our copyright dings come through YouTube. They're never on the site. We never get takedowns to the site. So it does not impact us. It, in fact, if you look at somewhere they posted on the Google blog, let me, this is a journal article. They posted a table of sites that would be affected. And it's all BitTorrent sites. That's, who, that's the sites that this is. But I, I don't think Google should be doing the job of, uh, you know, the copyright police, A. And B, uh, I think their copyright takedown system is so broken, and we've talked about that before. We get we get a taken down all the time uh, on YouTube by people who have no rights. In fact, the NASA rover mission, which NASA posted on YouTube, got taken down by Scripps Howard News Service because... The automatic content ID system, this happens all the time, ID'd the NASA footage, which is not copyrighted by NASA, and obviously they own, so that the YouTube is completely legal, duh. But it also is the same footage that appears in Scripps Howard television local news. And so the content ID said, Oh no, that's their local newscast, take it down. It was taken off the it was taken off YouTube for a while, and then you know a NASA complaint, and YouTube respond, uh, responded as they. But that, I don't think that should be even possible, and it happens all the time. So I have to think that YouTube, you know, given that they're using probably similar DMCA takedown systems, that you, this 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 thing is going to be a nightmare. This Google Google cake catering to copyrights, just a mistake. Very sad. We'll talk about it on Twitter. <sighs> My funky design, you've got a very good one. It's called iPhoto. It comes with the uh, Mac. Right, exactly. Perseid meteor shower. Everybody should go out and lie on their back and stare at the sky in a dark, dark, dark area. The office drop cam is not in the office. I don't know where it is. Or is... I don't know. Maybe maybe um, John's moving it around, probably. <sighs> NBC is streaming the closing ceremonies. Maybe they learned something, huh? Good for them. Paul Ryan is on the non-carb diet. There you go, Dr. Mom. Finally. Finally. Zero carbs in the White House. Finally. Dr. Mom hates this. I don't know why. I don't know why, but she really hates it. I think because she still wants to eat matzo balls and doesn't want to give them up. That's what I think. I love carbs too. That's why I can't eat them. There's one way to get people uh, interested in science. I am Mars. Uh, 
Kyle Benham, our musical director, will put the playlist up on the website, techguylabs.com, after each and every show. Phone number is 8888-ASK-LEO, 888. That's toll free in the U.S., by the way, 888-827-5536. If you're outside the U.S., we have I know we have many, thanks to the Internet, many, many listeners all over the world. If you're outside the Internet, I know if you're outside the, the U.S., if you're inside the Internet but outside the U.S., if you're on Mars, sorry, you're out of luck. But if you're at, inside the Internet but outside the U.S., you can use Skype or a similar program to call that number. And since it's toll-free, it shouldn't cost you anything. one 888 827 5536. Chris called that number from Livermore, California. Hi, Chris. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. How are you today? I'm pretty good. How are you? Great. What can I do for you? Uh, I am looking for a... Uh, I'm trying to transfer uh, a show and some movies off my DirecTV DVR and onto uh, a DVD for our, for our archival purposes sure as as many people would like to do yeah but the the, the remember the movie industry uh rules everything in this country and they don't want you to do it so guess <laughs> guess who wins chris it's we frust do. yeah no we don't well we do yes we do we win in the long run because i'm going to tell you how to do it anyway so the um, the issue is of course that you want to make a copy of what's on your dvr now, some DVRs, there's a, remember, there's TiVo to go. Some, some DVRs will actually allow you to do this, with, but they put copy restrictions in. They do all sorts of things to protect the movie industry. Because, really, you don't want to mess with the motion picture and the, uh, the content industry. Because those guys, they play rough. Um, it, to my knowledge, the DirecTV, there's no way to get it off the DirecTV directly. Uh, they scramble it, they encrypt it, they do all sorts of things. I know that your DirecTV box may well have a USB port. A FIFA. My Motorola box on a, uh, has a FireWire port. They're not connected to anything, but <laughs> it looks like you could do something with that, you know. Um, so what you have to do is take advantage of something that uh, is often called the analog hole. And believe me, Hollywood's tried to plug that up too. But it's kind of hard to do because... In order for a DVR to be at all useful, you have to be able to hook it up to a television and play this stuff back, right? So that's the analog hole. You can't get it. It's frustrating because you know you're looking at that DVR has a, has a hard drive in it. You should be able to just copy the file, you know, drag it across to an external hard drive, and boom, you're done. No. But you could play the movie back as if you're playing it to a TV, but instead of playing it to a TV, you're playing it, this is ridiculously complicated, to a video capture card that's attached to your computer which pretends it's a TV. In fact, you can even watch it on your computer, and then it is a TV, but meanwhile is also recording it. Now, the reason that the industry isn't freaked out about this because it does degrade it a little bit. It takes the digital signal, makes it analog, and then to burn it to a DVD, you've got to record it and turn it back to digital, back to bits. So that transition from digital to analog to digital, they go, well, we'd love to plug it up, but okay. They've tried. You know, uh, I don't know if you remember, but... Um, the VCRs had this thing called macrovision that if you tried to record a, a VHS cassette, you know, a commercial VHS cassette, it would all be lines and blurry and weird. And, and they have something now built into uh, all high def stuff called HDCP that protects the content by, by saying, you know, everything that plays it back has to be HDCP compliant, which means your video capture card won't work. So... You just, you know, use, use, it's not a big degradation. It's just a big pain. Use the analog hole and that'll work. Lewis, Hollywood, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Lewis. Hey, Leo. First, how about all those MacBooks at JPL? Yeah, I thought, uh, I saw that picture somewhere of a bunch of MacBooks. I guess Apple, yep. Apple nerds are going to, you know, say, yeah, see, smart people use Macs. Makes a Mac fanboy proud. You know, it's interesting. The processor that they used in the uh, Curiosity and in the landing uh, module. Uh, what is it called? The RAD 750, something like that. It's a very expensive, special space-hardened processor. Is actually based on the G3 chip that used to be in Macs many, 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 many moons ago. Power PC. It's a power PC chip, exactly. Not a G4, just a G3. But that's more um, than $200,000. <laughs> uh, the Onion News Network reported that... Uh, 
JPL and NASA are calling it a mission because the two gigabyte flash card is full now. <laughs> two megabyte, probably. Space stuff, um, you know, they don't need all the fancy stuff we have on our desktops. That's the irony. We actually have better computers on our desktop than uh, than, than they sent to Mars. But they don't yep. need it. They need they need radiation hardened, you know, reliable, slow but 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 steady stuff, and they that's what they put up there. Um, Leo, uh, there was an article in Smart Money uh, from Wall Street Journal this week that um, proposed two things. One, uh, Apple users are suffering from upgrade fatigue, and two, Apple needs more models of iPhone. Um, so, uh, I first of all. Is one iPhone a year enough? I know you're predicting a failure for iPhone. Well, 5. and that's my thinking is exactly the same thing. And it's not just uh, the Journal or, or Fast Company. Henry Blodgett wrote this, and uh, others have as well, saying, you know, Apple, because it only iterates yearly, is getting a little behind. For instance, the current iPhone, three and a half inches, looks mighty small compared to almost all the current crop of Android phones, which are four inches and up. Uh, they're not. Uh, you know, there is no LTE 4G iPhone. So these are. this is a chance. Apple has a chance to catch up. The problem is they'll be playing catch up to last year's models. And uh, they're going to have that same problem. And then, there, then there's other things that Apple are doing that I think some people are worried about. I'm very worried about, which is they're changing the connector from its traditional 30-pin connector, which it's, which it's had for... I, I've been listening to the podcast, I know. Well, you know, yeah. yeah, for years... To this, and again, we don't know. This is all speculation. But the 19-pin connector that will be incompatible. Yeah, sure, there'll be an adapter, but it's going to break a lot of cars, clocks, yeah, docks. It's uh, kind of frustrating. So I think what's happening. What I, who knows? You know what? All of all, we pundits said when the iPhone 4s was announced. Oh, too little, too late. Apple is come on. That's a minor upgrade. Big deal. And it's the fastest-selling iPhone of all time. Yep. So you you know you can't judge by what tech pundits think or say. We we get it wrong a lot, but I just I feel like Apple people should be looking at Android at this point. They should be considering it, and Apple's opening the door. But but you know remember a lot of the criticism of Android is that they ship uh, they ship uh, new phones every you know there's a new Android phone every three weeks. So people get how could people ever settle down with that? Exactly. And this article from Smart Money, they quoted some guy, a um, uh, Mac user for 20 years. He said, every time I buy something, it's out of date within a couple of months because the next iPad's coming out, the next iPhone's yeah. coming out, the next But they only iterate yearly. On <laughs> it's nothing compared to the, <laughs> the Android market. But don't you remember we all said the same thing about computers? We've been say we said that for years. It's slowed yep. down now. But when you're in an, a cycle where innovation is happening very rapidly... One of the unfortunate side effects is whatever you buy is going to be obsolete before you take it home. And was that way with computers? It slowed down. It'll be that way with cell phones for a little longer, not much longer. Hey, thanks for the call, Louis. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Sorry we ran out of time, Louis. But that was good questions, really great questions. And it's, what is that, rhythmic gymnastics? I just, I need a... We must be getting, the Olympics must be almost over. Right? <laughs> we're at the drag sports. We're at, we're at the ESPN, the Ocho sports. The, the walls was really weird. The balls was really weird. Synchronized swimming, all that stuff. Is it happened very fast in Japan? Do the Japanese uh, are? Do they? It seems like that would be a culture that would be even more averse to change than the uh, Western cultures, but maybe not. Badminton, another great sport. <laughs> Five thousand meter final. Now that's a sport. Now that's a manly sport. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta read that. I'm not knocking any sport. These people are so much more everything than I am. They're better in every way. That's just nuts. Wow. I'm sorry I missed this. Actually, I can't believe they can do that. They're not allowed to touch anything, right? You can. 
just kind of float there. And obviously these people are hugely strong and athletic and synchronized. <laughs> They're like twins. That's crazy. These are great shots. And you have the lung capacity of a wave. Wait, my God, it's Scott Wilkinson just appeared in my rear view mirror. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Scott. Hey, Leo, how you doing? I am well. How are you, sir? Well, um, I'm pretty blown out. Uh, some Whoever's doing the lower thirds today needs to change my lower third. Uh-oh, what, is, what, 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 what should I say? I got canned from home oh, theater. Oh, Scott. I, I sent you an email hoping you would call me and I could we could talk about it. Oh but, my uh, God, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it was it was a to apparently they told me it was a total financial decision. Yeah, they're struggling. Uh, you know, so what should I change it to? Uh, just my home theater geeks. Well, thank you know, God you're doing TV that, stuff. huh? Yeah, I know. <laughs> wow, I am so sorry. Yeah, it's. Uh, thank you. It's it's a it was a big big blow and totally oh, God, surprising. Scott. Totally Are you gonna unexpected. actually have to go out and get a job now? <laughs> oh, Scott. Well, you know I'm gonna have to put some stuff together. Oh um, man, and nobody at our age should ever have to look for work. I'm hip to that. <laughs> That's like being a teenager. Well, uh, thanks to all everybody in the chat room. By the way, uh, it's time to make my own site. I, I am thinking about that. Um, yeah, I'm glad you're doing this show, and I'm glad you're doing Home Theater Geeks. And uh, I know we don't pay you diddly do, so it's not helping you financially, but at least maybe it'll help, uh, uh, you know, with keep, your Keep my presence. name out there. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And uh, I, I would love to speak with you at some point. Uh, I have many ideas how I might I be know, able to. I know, but we have no money. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> I don't want to get in the position that they got in where you have to lay off people because you can't afford them, you know? Well, and so yeah. we don't. That's why we basically we don't employ people. We do. We pay them stipends to do shows. Sure. Uh, and if the shows are profitable, then that changes. But most shows are not. So it's kind of a difficult right. situation. Hold on. Here we go. All right. We'll talk. I will talk to you off the air, though, for sure. Scott Wilkinson, uh, the t the latest uh, home theater guru here. He uh, hosts a show on our network. I love it called Home Theater Geeks. At uh, twit.tv slash htg. You can also catch that live if you want. You can get it after the fact. We make audio and video. See, I'm not like the DVR people. I'm not like Hollywood where I say, right. oh, no, you can't have a copy of this. We give everything away for free. It's ad support. I like it. That's why I like ad supported. It's ad supported. So you just make, you know, you want a copy, you want this show, just go to the website. You can get it. You can download it. Scott's show, same thing. And you can even watch live. 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern Time. 20, uh, that's uh, uh, 2000 Ooh, UTC. I can't on remember. On Mondays. I, well, you know, the problem, I have to add tank one, add 12, that's 13, add seven, that's 2000. That's what I have to do in my head every single time. Hey, Scotty, how are you? Leo, I'm doing good. How about yourself? I am well. Welcome back to the show. You've Thank been you watching so your 3D Always Olympics good. brought to you by Panasonic. <laughs> yes, I have. With the bizarrely uh, uh, pixelated uh, Bob Costas. Yeah, the 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 opening segments where, with Bob Costas are very weird. They're not aligned well. I'm not sure whether it's the distance between the two lenses in the camera or what, but it just it kind of makes me dizzy. You know, uh, we get into the after regular you said Olympics this, and it's much better. After you said this last week, I made a mm. point of watching. They're definitely. He's in soft focus for sure. Yeah. He's he's got the Zsa, Zsa Gabor lens on the camera. <laughs> and I'm wondering if that's not causing some of the problem. It is absolutely soft focus on him. It's very there's something very odd looking. It's very odd looking and uh, soft focus may very well be part of it, but it's also the the relationship between the two eye views, right. the left eye and the right eye view. Uh it's just it just looks very strange. Uh, once we get into the Olympics themselves, it's better. Although, as I said, I think last week, I've been noticing an awful lot of ghosting uh, or crosstalk is the more technical term. And what that means is the left eye is seeing some of what the right eye should be seeing and vice versa. It's especially apparent on signage. 
So the London oh, 2012 signs all over the place. You see yeah. that. Uh, in some of the uh, uh, players, the per uh, participants' uniforms have white stripes on them. You'll see, uh, you'll see that ghosting. So it's, it's just not, it, it's not wowing me. It's not bowling me. I think it's over. because it's live. It's real time. That um, you know that when you do a movie, you very carefully after the fact fix yes, everything up. Yes. And, and that maybe, may be part of it. That may be part of it. The other part of it is that uh, you're only seeing half resolution in each eye. Because they have to fit the 3D image in the same broadcast bandwidth as a regular 2D oh. high-def image. And how they do that is they split one, either the horizontal or the vertical direct, uh, resolution, in half. And in the case of the Olympics, they're splitting the horizontal resolution in half. They're going what's called side-by-side. -side. You can tell, because so if you tune it in on a non-3D TV, you get two side-by-side yeah. -side pictures. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. So you have a 3D TV you can see this on? No, I don't. That's the point. Isn't if you look on a non-3D TV? Oh, I got you. Okay, it'll right. work, but you get two pictures. Yeah. You get side exactly. by side. Yeah. Right. And each one has instead of 1920 it's uh, lower it's resolution. Got, yeah. Yeah, it's got half of that. So a uh, yeah. Now they've also been doing. I don't know if you, you haven't. There's no way you could see it. Like, you'd either have to be in London or Japan to see this. But they're also doing this. A super high resolution version in what's called UHD or ultra high definition. It's not 4K. That's, it's better than 4K, but it's not quite 8K. It's in between somewhere. Well, it's yeah. It's uh, instead of 4K is sometimes 4096 across, sometimes 3840 across, and that's what's called quad HD because yeah. it's four times the resolution of HD. 8K can be 8192 or whatever it is. Or it can be 78-something, which is twice again 3840. I know we're throwing around a bunch of numbers here, but the point is it's close to 8,000 pixels across and 4,000 pixels down. So it's leapfrogging over 4K, which we've been talking about as kind of the next generation of, um, of high def, you know, of greater resolution. They said, ah, 4K, we can do better than that. So Japan is broadcasting experimentally. Some of the Olympics in 8K now. You could also special. see it if you're in London. They have, uh, you know, they're, they're oh, showing. do they? Yeah. yeah, probably on these giant outdoor screens. I would imagine. Uh, I know you have to go into a theater, but uh, oh. yeah, they're showing it in theaters. And actually, we talked to somebody on one of our shows. We have a uh, you know Tech News Today with Tom Merritt every uh, Monday through Friday is a Tech News show, and he had a tech journalist who was in London who saw it, and he said it's just spectacular. And I, to me, that I want to see that. I'd rather see that than these faulty uh, 3D funky 3d stuff unfortunately i i am now agreeing with you at least in terms of broadcast 3d right uh I it takes you know, 48 I've seen, I've watched a few of it takes 48 gigabits a second <laughs> <laughs> to do this 8k <laughs> to do this so i don't think it's i don't think we're even uh, well no even the google fiber you couldn't watch this on i mean it's ridiculous the bandwidth is is it's high high bandwidth required the cameras anyway gig well, they compress it. So here's the deal. It's coming from yeah, the cameras at 48 right. gigabits per second, then compressed right. down to something that actually you could do on Google Fiber. And maybe this is the argument for Google Fiber, which is a gigabit both ways. Right. They compress it down to 360 megabits per second. Uh, okay, so and, you could easily do that on Google Fiber. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, it is. It is. Uh, on last week's show, on last week's uh, Home Theater Geeks, I was talking with Kevin Wines of uh, THX. He's their image technology director. And we were talking about the future of TV. And how, I asked him, how are, you gonna, how are we going to deliver 4K, much less 8K? Yeah. And he said, by, by means of better compression algorithms, which you were just talking well, yeah, about. Yeah, it's highly compressed if you go from, uh, what was it again? 48, 48 gig gigabits. To 300 meg. Yeah, to 360 megabits. That's, that's a lot of yeah. compression, yeah. It's a lot of compression, yeah. but compression algorithms are getting so good these days that you can do that much compression and not see, not take a really serious hit in picture quality. Do you remember, it's folks, and I know you remember, Scott, I certainly do, the first time you saw HD. It, oh, yeah. It, like, it almost felt like it hurt your eyes, like you hadn't been wearing glasses all this time. You put on glasses, and wow, it's right. just crisp. And, that's, and yeah. we're talking now... Four times, what are we talking? Four times the resolution horizontally and vertically? A lot uh, yes, more. Yes, for 8K. Yeah, yeah. It would be 7680 8, by 4320. 
That's it. That's exactly and right. I, Not quite 8K, but close. But when you see something like that, it looks like you're looking through a window. That's right. Like you're looking at real life. Yep. <laughs> and as you've said many times, that is going to be more... 3D, more lifelike yeah. than actual 3D, than, than stereoscopic 3D. And and while it uh, sounds undoable, I mean, it sounds like, well, are you kidding me? we got to get displays of that size. we got to get bandwidth like that. HD yeah. took a while, but when it happened, it really took yeah. over. And I just think that it's going to be, in the next 20 years, it's going to be the standard. It's going to be, uh, you know, you'll have a wall in your house. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm sitting watching, true. I'm watching on a 10-foot screen. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's not so far fetched. It fills your entire field of view, right? It does. I feel like when they dive off the diving board, it actually my butt hurts because I just feel like they're going to hit. <laughs> it's so scary the platform. It's so scary that you yeah. feel like you're dive. It's just terrifying. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, so yeah, you're right. The the Olympics are winding down. I've been enjoying the synchronized swimming. I, I actually find that part pretty nice. Well, I'm glad you enjoy. <laughs> Scotty Wilkinson, Home Theater Geek. I'm going to ask you when you come back who you got on the show this week. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm watching, like, I'm watching, uh, this is, a, we have a direct TV signal here. And yeah. uh, it's okay now, but uh, yesterday there was so much compression going on. That it was just well, blurry. We labs. We to when there was a lot of movement, it just looked horrible. And I have to think that yeah. some of this stuff is just com it's over compression. Well, I have to tell you, I, I was a Dish subscriber for many years, and I switched over to DirecTV. Um, and I, there are many things I like about DirecTV over Dish. I like the user interface better. Uh, but the one thing I've noticed is every once in a while, the image will get very uh, pixelated, very yeah. blocky. Yeah. And I did. I never saw that on Dish, uh, and so I think that Directv is doing more compression, uh, and not as good as perhaps they could. Isn't that uh, interesting? So, huh? Yeah, I do. I do so, find that if very you now, that's actually we should talk about that sometime. If you wanted the best video sure. fidelity, you would. Wa oh, now she's doing ribbons. Oh, that's so. I love ry ry rhythmic gymnastics <laughs> and the ribbons. It's so graceful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I guess I if beach so. volleyball could be a sport, this could be a sport, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is yeah, pretty there, amazing. There are, some, there are some sports that kind of make me scratch my head and go, why did they include this? It seems like they wanted to just do it to do it. I mean, synchronized diving? Well, that's pretty amazing. It is amazing. But single diving is pretty amazing, yeah. too. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm kind of a fan of the of like the decathlon and the heptathlon. I like the I like this when it shows a person is just a complete all around athlete. When she, the Ennis yeah, won won when when Jessica Ennis uh, won the uh, heptathlon for the women and uh, uh, I was just blown away at her athleticism that she could do oh, javelin, yeah. shot put, uh, run. I mean, it's just uh, I think that's cool. Yeah, yeah, I think that's cool. I kind of like those individual sports like gymnastics. Uh, or decathlon or so too. on that, that shows yeah. your skill yeah. as opposed to kind of brute force like the 10,000 meter run okay so that's i can't do that yeah. I, I appreciate the skill involved in that yeah. but it seems more brute force than than uh fine skill oh but you know? to to watch uh uh Radishu, uh win the, what was that uh, that he won the 2000 meters the 1000 meters the kenyan he's a Maasai warrior and it was the most beautiful like, graceful Thing and he was just way that. out ahead the whole time, and he just he broke a world record. It was wow, it was stunning. Wow. It was eight hundred meter. It was stunning. It was such See, grace and form and style, and it was amazing. This this is why I like the Olympics. You know, I watch them. I'm I'm not a sports guy. Anybody who knows me will tell you I'm not a sports guy. I don't watch football. I don't yeah. watch baseball or basketball, but I do watch the Olympics because it's oh, I just love it. it's I, I, I love the World Cup too. Human I endeavor. love. Yeah, and I love the countries coming together, and I yeah, think it's yeah. really cool. Absolutely. Wow, look at her in that ribbon. My goodness, she's good. She just <laughs> threw it in the air, and now she's rolling it up. And okay, here we go. Oh no, maybe not. Somebody sent me an email saying, "I think there's something wrong with the podcast. I hear you talking, and then I hear commercials in the background. What's that all about?" 
<laughs> so, well, you're you're hearing what's going on in the studio. So if you're watching right now or listening to the podcast or watching, you're hearing what's going on in the studio. I do have to keep this up a little bit in the background because so otherwise, you know when to come back. <laughs> I don't know when to come. It's not like there's a light comes on in the studio or anything. The only way I know is what I hear. So I, I apologize, but there is a little bit of a dink a dink dink in the background. But that's yeah, uh, do a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's so me. Kenny, so. Kenny Crayley in this chat room is saying sports does look good in 1080, but not so much in 720p. I would have to say uh, broadcast 1080i might be a little more problematic in sports than 720p. I like 720p. I don't mind because that. it's progressive. You don't have the interlace right. artifacts, right. And, and there's a lot of fast motion in sports, which would make that a problem. All right, here we go. Yeah. And I'll just do a quick wrap up with you. Unless you have a. Right, Leo. Leo, your live read is no, no. not 32. No. Okay. And then, uh, Scott, you're up. Your new job, rhythmic gymnastics. <laughs> Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. With me, Scott Wilkinson, the home theater expert, host of Home Theater Geeks on the Twit Network, and uh, and my regular fill-in host, too, by the way. We've got some of those Which coming I'm up for you, Scott. always happy to do yep. anytime. Yep. Yep. You betcha. So uh, who's on Home Theater Geeks this week? Uh, this week is Gene Dolgoff. He is the inventor oh. of LCD, techno- LCD projection technology. Yeah. He's a legend. And... He is a legend, actually. He's got his own Wikipedia page and everything. Yeah. And um, he's going to be talking. He is a big 3D advocate, and he's going to be talking about a new project that he's actually asking people's help for to submit ideas for designs. And he's going to pick the best one and actually pay them ah. to to implement a design. So we're going to learn all about what this new project is and how people can uh, submit their ideas. Uh, to him for uh, a potential gig. Cool. Yeah, I, th- I thought that sounded pretty cool. Scott Wilkinson, home theater geek extraordinaire. <laughs> we'll talk again. Maybe. We'll talk again real soon. You bet. My pleasure. Take Thank care, you. Scott. Bye bye. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Back to the phones uh, we go. And it's Bill in Culver City, California. Hey, Bill, Leo Laporte here. Hi, thank you, Leo. It's good to speak with you. Good to talk to you. Um, hi. So um, here's what's going on. Uh, I, I'm looking for a product recommendation. Uh, I'm looking for a, a Wi-Fi radio, nothing fancy, something simple that I could use within the house strictly uh, that I could move around from room to room that would be wall-powered um, and that it would remember uh, its settings, its configuration. Oh. Yeah, and with an onboard speaker. And uh, well, humidity resistant also because I'd like to use it in uh, in, in in the bathroom during a shower. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm looking around. I'm not really finding a whole lot of product recommendations, and so I'm uh, I'm calling you. That's an interesting question. I mean, I you know they don't. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> say usually on the specs. You can unplug it, carry it around, and it'll remember its settings. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I don't. I'm not sure. Uh, I I use one that I really like from a company called Grace. They make a variety of internet radios. Okay. Uh, and the one I use is one of the higher end ones called the Grace Mondo. Okay. And I love it. It has a very nice uh, user interface. You can get it for about, um, I think that one's around two hundred, almost two hundred bucks. But uh, the Grace has other less expensive radios. Really, okay. li- really like it. It has a big LCD screen, so it almost looks like a smartphone, and it has Pandora. And do what? Do you, what do you listen to? Are you looking for r- radio stations? Yeah, um, WABC, uh, yeah. KF. I mean that, that sort of thing. It's yeah. Strictly talk. I don't care so about it music. has it has iHeartRadio, which will give you all the clear channel stations. It has uh, TuneIn. Well, I don't know if it's TuneIn. It has an internet radio uh, interface. Another very good one that's less expensive and very robust. Comes from C Crane Company. It's about one hundred forty dollars list price. Uh, it's called their CC Wi Fi Internet Radio. I like Internet Radio a lot. Yeah. Um, I I just because a lot of times, uh, you know, you get to hear radio stations all over the country. You can hear podcasts, variety of things. I mean, this this radio claims eighteen thousand stations. I think that's about right. Now that brings up another question too. Um, in my uh, in my research, I was I was uh, finding that. Um, you have to go through um, Receiva. Uh, sites called Receiver or something. Receiva, yeah. You don't have yeah. to go through Receiva, but it's a lot easier if you do because what you could do is set up favorite stations on Receiva. It's easier to search on a computer 
for the station yeah. and add them to your presets. But you don't have to go through them. So I consider receive a, a nice feature, but but it's not a it, it, most of the, my experience. Most of these, it's not a requirement. They all have directories. Yeah, and, and that was the, the kind of scary part because I was wondering, okay, uh, so I get the product and it has some sort of reliance on Receiva and well, that's you know the website and and they they uh, they tank they they uh, sink, and then you know if if the product is dependent on um, you know uh, a, a third party like that, well, uh, that means my product is hosed. Uh, no, I don't, I wouldn't worry about that. Receiva's been around a long time, and I think that if Receiva went away, they would find an, a, another way to uh, to integrate oh. in. Yeah, I wouldn't worry. I, I have never, that doesn't bother me so much. The station database could come from other places. One of the things you'll find if you have an internet radio is that you get firmware updates on a regular basis. So oh. if, if Receiva goes away, you just get, they download a new, uh, you know, directory somewhere else. There are other companies doing this. Okay, uh, this is a little more reassuring. Yeah, cause... I wouldn't worry about that. The other thing I would uh, p- point out is that most of these, I know the Mondo and the CC, uh, C-Crane radio, have batteries as well as AC. So okay. if you put batteries in, it would maintain its settings, even if you unplugged it. All right, uh, then that sounds good. And uh, yeah, this is most helpful, and I uh, look forward to getting... Uh, one of these products here. Oh, well, last question. Um, do, do you have um, any recommendations about um, sites uh, uh, that also uh, uh, focus on product uh, Wi-Fi radio product reviews? You know, I don't CNET- know of somebody that does that. Occasionally, I'll, we'll review them. I've reviewed quite a few. Okay. CNET might, but I don't think any. I don't know of like a uh, a site dedicated to that. Okay. Well, anyhow, Leo, this was most helpful, and I thank you for your time My and pleasure, recommendation. Bill. Yeah, it's like you can never go wrong with Sea Crane. Their stuff is well built. The truth is, probably all these radios have the same guts inside. They're just packaging them. Um, I would also, I'll add a couple of other things to keep in mind. They don't fit Bill's uh, specifications, like taking them in the shower. But, you know, your smartphone almost certainly has internet radio capability. The f- my favorite app for Android and iOS on that is called TuneIn Internet Radio Pro. You're probably seeing ads for it. It's kind of uh, started to lead the pack for internet radio. It's just fantastic. And then, of course, Clear Channel has iHeartRadio. CBS has its own radio app. Unfortunately, CBS decided to pull its stations, and there are hundreds of CBS stations coast to coast, off of most of the directories. They want you to listen through their own app. I hope that's not a trend. iHeartRadio did not do that. I actually think they did the right thing, which is they encourage you to use their app because there's value-added stuff. You know, there's there's uh, music stations and stuff that, that, are, that are not traditional radio stations. So I think that's a good way to do it. They give you some incentive. But, but, but wait, boy, I tell you, when you pull all the CBS streams off uh, these uh, internet radios, that really hurts, I think. I think that's a mistake. You can't get, for instance, the CBS radio streams on uh, TuneIn Internet Radio. Um, and then the final thing I'll say, which is just really exceedingly expensive, but it's how I listen to internet radio now, and I love it, is, and I'm a big fan of this company, Sonos, S-O-N-O-S. This is not inexpensive, uh, but it, they have a whole system uh, that allows you to have music in each room of your uh, of your house or the patio or outside, so you don't have to move stuff around. And they not only support internet radio, they support Pandora, Songza. They just added Amazon Cloud Player, which means if I have all of my music on Amazon Cloud Player, I can play any of it over the internet through my Sonos. Um, I have a Sonos connection that goes to my home theater system, so that's a full stereo, so that's the best quality sound. And you can also buy... Uh, Sonos speakers, they have small ones and big ones that you could put around the house. And you could put them in party mode so that everything's playing the same thing. Or, or and I love this, each room can play something different. It's, it's really kind of the ultimate in-house music setup. But it's pretty pricey. So, um, you know, there are less expensive. If you just want a simple internet radio, there are less expensive ways to go. Scott, you're still here. I am. I'm just uh, in the chat room. <laughs> hey, go ahead. Talk to the chat room. It's your okay. Here's your chance to talk to the chat room. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you six minutes of Scott Wilkinson. Yay! Ad free without commercial interruption. <laughs> or at least low, low, low level, level commercial, commercial interruption. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so yeah, I, I was going to take off, but uh, I'm still here, and I'd be happy to spend uh, the next six minutes uh, with the chat room. So if you guys have any questions, I am here for you. By the way, thank you all very much. Uh, you've all posted, many of you have posted great supportive comments about losing my job, which is truly sad. Truly sad. Thank you, Sunny Manitoba. Uh, I, I value the time I spend here in the chat room greatly, so... If anybody has any questions, what are my plans for the future? Um, probably, you know, there aren't too many full-time jobs with Benny's anymore. Uh, the publishing industry is suffering, generally speaking. It's not just uh, the company that publishes home theater, but um, it is, um, it, it's generally pretty bad. And uh, JEB, I will not comment on the cause of that. Uh, because it's much more complicated than simply one person. But um, Padre SJ, yes, I lost my job this week. Uh, I'd been working four and a half years at hometheater.com and before that, ultimateav.com. Um, but uh, they came to me this week and said, uh, we're eliminating your position due to economic concerns. Uh, so that was quite a shocker. And uh, now what I'm going to do is try to uh, do as much freelance work as I can, um, probably put up my own website, uh, start offering content. Uh, I know Leo goes for the ad, mod, ad revenue model. Um, I'm thinking about that. There's really two ways to do it. One is um, the, the ad-supported model, and the other is... Uh, uh, fees and subscriptions and charging users for information. Now, that's a hard sell because everybody expects information to be free online. So, um, but, but, you know, selling ads is very hard, as I have painfully learned this week. Uh, you know, the few home theater companies that there are, uh, you know, are really s scaling back on their advertising spending. It's so odd that it's not the same as uh, the audiophile industry. Stereophile Magazine, the, a, a sibling publication to Home Theater, and The Absolute Sound uh, are both doing great because there are a million little two-channel audio companies that can afford to spend a little money on advertising, and there aren't that many outlets to spend that money on. Uh, home Theater, on the other hand, especially like big screen TV, you need a, a giant facility to build it and a clean room and all this kind of stuff, so there aren't very many companies who are doing it, and they're all hurting. And therefore, they don't spend about as much on ads. And TVs, uh, you're right, um, uh, Jay, in the chat room, manufacturing companies have thin margins, razor thin, when it comes to TV. That's exactly right. Um, Web2628 asks, what are the best 3D TVs under four to $500? I'm not sure there are any 3D TVs in the four to $500 range. Uh, you do have to get a little higher than that in order to do that. Uh, Web One says I can do affiliate fees for products I recommend on my blog. Well, yeah, but that's kind of like them paying for uh, for uh, positive press. At least it looks like that, so that might be a little weird. Um, thanks, Loquacious. Uh, it's it is it really stinks, definitely. Um, yeah, Kenny and the Skull. I Scott Wilkinson is a valued brand. Maybe get an agent. Well, yeah, if I could afford one, that might be a good idea. Uh, Bluetooth earbuds, Becky, uh, okay for audiobooks and uh, light music listening. I, I don't know much about earbuds. I would direct you to uh, a, a website called innerfidelity.com, run by Tile Hertzens, who knows everything there is to know about headphones. Uh, thank you so much, Padre SJ, that uh, your heart goes out to me. I really appreciate that. That means an awful lot to me. Um, let's see, Lawn Dog uh, found some old uh, videos uh, that he took at the Renaissance Fair 17 years ago on uh, like 8 millimeter videotape or something, so I found that uh, very interesting. Uh, he might very well find the band that I was in, uh, in which we wore kind of beef eater costumes. So you want to look for a band that's playing, I'm playing the sack butt, which looks like a trombone, um, and there's a drummer and a few other players, and we all look like beef eaters. And so if you find a shot of a band marching around uh, that look, they look like a bunch of beef eaters, I'm probably one of them. 
Um, Dr. Co Candy uh, thought about selling my music online. Yeah, maybe that's certainly one possibility. Uh, Jim uh, Diedrichson says, what about YouTube Partners Program? Didn't know about that. I'll have to look into that. Uh, Padre SJ, thank you so much. You, uh, you say you, ins you respect my integrity, and that is certainly something that I have carefully cultivated over the years and want to definitely maintain. Uh, so that is that was that. Where was I? Well, loquacious. Was I at the old Paramount Ranch? That's where the Renaissance Fair was when I was there at the beginning. Yes, absolutely. That is correct. Oh, loquacious! You worked that fair for years. What'd you do? Uh, were you in the Were you in the ale stand? Then you certainly saw us because we played in all the ale stands for free beer. Um, JC is wondering about Bluetooth TV listening for wireless headphones. Uh, not sure I can make a recommendation there. Again, that's probably a question for uh, Inner Fidelity. Uh, oh, Theater Monkey is saying good price 42-inch 3D Vizio. I forgot about Vizio. Yes, I suspect that uh, uh, Vizio might have a 3D TV in the four to $500 range. They, they'd be the only ones. And, uh, but, but they make a pretty good TV. I'm, I'm generally happy with them. Loquacious was street acting. He was at the Die Spot, the Maypole. Whatever they needed to do, all right. Um, I could do some audio work. I'm thinking very much about doing also uh, calibrations. You know, I own the calibration equipment that I used at the magazine to evaluate TVs, so I could easily go out to uh, customers' homes and calibrate their TVs. Uh, let's see, Lawn Dog's out in the Desert Empire, um, and he has a home, home theater guru out there, and he's going to mention my services all the rich people with the fan who love fancy names excellent very good thank you lawn dog i appreciate that that's certainly one reason i need to get a site up sooner than later so that i can point people to it and and mention that particular service um and wordsworth is exactly right the publishing business is going to freelance and contract journalists lowers the liability exposure and labor costs don't have to pay for uh, bennies and stuff like that of course health insurance uh, is going to be a real tricky thing for me. My wife works in healthcare, actually, but she's only part time at Cedar Sinai Hospital, uh, and she's thinking about uh, upping her hours so that she can get some bennies, and I can be on that for once. She's been on mine for most of our 22 years of marriage, but uh, I certainly don't mind uh, flipping that over. Uh, Telly Tubby uh, says that I've done a great job building my own brand. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being a fan, definitely. Okay. Uh, there you go. Thank you, Scott. My pleasure. My pleasure. Nice we'll job. Next week. All right. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's nice. That was fun. I like that. A little extra content for free. Oh, we might start charging you for that stuff. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. It's time to talk computers, the internet, cell phones, camcorders, MP3 players, home theater, and all that jazz as we do each and every weekend right here. I guess I could officially call it the Tech Guy Radio Network, as other hosts do. We're over 180 stations now, coast to coast. That's pretty good, plus the internet, which puts us all over the world. That's not so bad. Glad to have you aboard. We appreciate it. Phone number, if you have a question or a comment or a suggestion, is 8888-ASK-LEO. So I said I would talk a little bit about this Internet Explorer brouhaha. And it's, it it's, takes a little explanation. That's why I, uh, I deferred it till uh, at some point when I have some time. So the next version of Microsoft's web browser is Internet Explorer, and there's a whole thing going on right now. Uh, uh, by the way, I'm a, I'm a kind of out of the mainstream on this, but there's a thing uh, going on right now. Uh, people don't like something called tracking cookies, which I think are very poorly named. So I'm not going to use that term, tracking cookies, although that's the, con the term that's used. I'm going to use a term that I think is more accurate, which is called ad personalization cookies. I know that didn't help much, did it? <laughs> a cookie is a way a browser has of, of saving 
uh, preferences or settings in between sessions. It saves it in a cookie. A website can also set a cookie. Anytime you visit a page, it can set a cookie. It can save on your browser uh, information about what page you visited, what your preferences are, and so forth. Advertisers can do that as well. So when you see an ad banner, now there are, there are a number of uh, different ad agencies, internet ad agencies out there, but let's use Google because that's probably the biggest and the best known. <clears throat> and Google owns, uh, you know, some big ad companies and so forth. So let's say you see, uh, let's say you see an ad, it's served to you, you go, uh, we'll give you an example. Let's go, and these are all made up, starbucks.com. Let's say you go to starbucks.com and you see there a Google ad. Well, that Google ad is served from Google's servers. So Google is a first party in that case. Not just Starbucks, but Google as well, because Starbucks has given them permission to embed ads on the Starbucks page. That means that the Google ad can set a cookie saying, oh, he was at Starbucks and he saw this ad. Now let's say you go to DunkinDonuts.com. And Google also has ads there. This is very common. Google has ads on many, 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 many sites. Now, Google can check cookies set by Google. So it says, oh, you were just at Starbucks. And now you're at Dunkin' Donuts. And this is what Google will do with that. That's called a tracking cookie, by the way, or I, as I would call it, an internet ad personalization cookie. Because what happens now, you go to another site, and Google, based on the signals you've given it, might show you an ad for coffee. Maybe it'll show you a Starbucks ad, maybe Dunkin' Donuts, maybe it'll be Tim Hortons, maybe it'll be another company. You know, that happens all the time. If you're chock full of nuts, is that a company still? Do they still make coffee? <laughs> if you're chock full of nuts, uh, you might say, hey, Google, when anybody visits, you know, coffee-focused sites, could you please put a chock full of nuts ad up? And that's the ad personalization that happens. Google says, ah, you're interested in coffee, let's show you an ad from an advertiser who says, I want people who are interested in coffee. In my opinion, that's a good thing because you're going to get ads that are, if this works, and it unfortunately doesn't work very well, but if it works in theory anyway, you'll get ads for things you're interested in. But I understand you don't want that to happen, so you can turn off these ad personalization cookies. This is something new. The FTC has mandated something called do not track. Again, I don't like the word track because it implies they're following you around. What they're interested in is what signals you can give a company, an ad company, about what products you're interested in so they can show you relevant ads. This is something that doesn't happen on television, which is why you see ads for stuff you're not interested in all the time. The theory being if you were seeing stuff, ads for stuff you were interested in that wouldn't be as intrusive, it wouldn't be as annoying, and it would be more effective. So that's why they do it. But I understand some people find this intrusive. I don't want you to show me ads for stuff I'm interested in. I think really where it comes from is that it doesn't work very well. So you may get ads for stuff you're really not interested in. <laughs> you know, let's say you're doing uh, some funeral planning for a, a, a relative that passed away. And so you visit a number of funeral homes and casket sites and so forth. And now you get ads everywhere you go for caskets. That one might be a little intrusive and annoying, and that's the problem is that these signals aren't very good. And this isn't a, it's an imperfect system. But some people really infer from the name tracking cookie that companies are doing something really nefarious, like collating all the places you visit and trying to build a profile of who you are, where you live, what you like. And uh, you know what? There's too many of us. They don't do that. They don't care. It's not valuable to them. In fact, a, a number, uh, there was a, a great quote a couple of weeks ago from a company that does this. The guy says, we don't want a, your name. That's noise. That's un, that's not, that doesn't help us at all. Personal information about you doesn't help us. We just want to know what you're interested in so we can show you an ad for something you're interested in. That's where the money is. Anyway, they've got a do not track registry. Advertisers have gotten together and said, yeah, we'll, we'll okay, we don't have to, but we will honor this. And all the new browsers have a setting that you can check it says, do not track. I don't want ad preferences. I wish they'd call it ad preferences because then I think people would understand what they're really turning off. I don't want ad customization. No, thank you. It says tracking and implies, oh, they're spying on me, and that's why people don't want it. Internet Explorer 10 has such a setting. And at first, Microsoft said, we're going to have it on by default. We're just, when it comes, it, comes, it turns on. 
And the reason this is a big deal is because people never change the defaults. 90% of users don't change the homepage. They don't look at security settings. They don't look at privacy settings. They just accept what it is. And this got the ad industry up in arms. They're saying, Microsoft, you're the dominant browser, and you're going to break our model. The Internet relies on the efficiency of our advertising. You're, in effect, going to set up a standard on your browser that breaks our, that hurts our efficiency dramatically. So at first, Microsoft said, all right, all right, we won't do it. This week, they announced they will do it. They said, no, nope, we decided we're going to have it turned on. That's what consumers want. We're going to turn it on by default. Now, unfortunately, that may have the reverse effect because it doesn't it doesn't adhere to the standard for that was set by the World Wide Web Consortium, which governs how the web runs, for how do not track should be. They said the standard is it's an opt-in feature. That is, you must actively check it. It should not be turned on by default. And if a company does do that, the ad companies are free to ignore it. I know this is very complicated, but what essentially Microsoft has done is they've made that setting useless on IE10. Ad companies can now ignore it because they decided to make it the default turned on. It's completely the opposite of their intention. Or maybe it was. Maybe it is their intention. Maybe they're really sneaky. Maybe they're very sly. <laughs> but what it means is people who browse with IE10, their preference will be ignored unless Microsoft changes its tune. Their preference will be ignored, legally ignored, by ad companies because they didn't follow the specification. Is that wild? <laughs> I just have to point out that you would get a lot of great free stuff on the Internet. I'll, Facebook's a very good example. That's free, and you, it's amazingly useful. And how do how does it get paid for? It's very expensive, you know. I mean, those servers, they've got big server farms. This is an expensive process to have 800 million users. It's ad-supported. And when you block ads or when you hurt, you know, you're, this is a tra trade you make. Maybe not an explicit in your mind trade. And I, that's part of what we do on this show. I want, you, want it to be explicit in your mind. But if you like a free web service, then you need to pay for it. Somebody said this is a, a great saying. And it's an anonymous quote, unfortunately. That if you're not paying for a service, then you are the product. If you're not paying for a service on the web, then they're selling you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Did I explain that at all well? I know it's so complicated. I just want people to understand this. So, uh, Josh, is, is Josh here? Topic in business today. And I have to you say, just bring it. it. Oh, you can always just bring it in. Just quietly put it down. That's fine. You don't have to. Josh is not here today? And okay. I'll tell you, you get everything. You get not just email. You get so I want to, I'll just send him an email because I think that would be the segment I'd like to use for uh, you get, of course, word the iHeartRadio thing. Presentation. All of it with corporate branding. So it looks like it's your business process right there running on one of the most reliable communication platforms ever. But what about training? What about support? What about migration? And that's where it comes down to Verticor. Verticor, a Google premier partner, one of the best in the country. Let's use the first segment from hour two on they Saturday. People to the cloud with Google Apps. Tracking you, cookies. Free activation, setup, and support for just $3.95. So I wonder if I change the name from tracking cookies to add customization. Does that change people's? Does that, that changes your opinion of it? Doesn't it? And I think so. I think part of the problem is just taxonomy. It's just it was named poorly. <laughs> that that it, it, it sounds scary. Tracking cookies. It sounds scary. But it and, and actually on Facebook and other places when you turn it off Google too, they call it ad customization or ad personalization. You could turn that off. Um, here I'll show you. If I get a Google ad, let me get a Google ad somewhere. Uh, let's search for music here. On the Google. Um, God, not getting any ads. Uh, Olympics. Let's get a, let's get some ads here first. Okay. So then and you look at the ad, it says, why this ad? Okay. 
This ad is based on your current search terms. Visit Google's Ad Preferences Manage to look more. Oh, I have to log in. Okay. Now, ad personalization is what they call it, right? So I can opt out. If you don't want to see any personalized ads for Google, you can opt out. This is turning off tracking cookies. Those who opted in see 1% fewer ads than opted out users. Opted in users are 30% more likely to click on ads. That's because, in theory, these ads are personalized. So this is this, these are tracking cookies. This is what it's talking about, but Google calls it, and I think it's more accurate, personalized ads. What do you think? Yeah, they could have called them stalking cookies, but that's the impression I think that people get from tracking cookies, right? Because it's more accurately describing what it does, Jeff. It's not tracking you. It's trying to figure out what, what you're interested in so they can serve you the right ads. That's all people are doing with them. Tracking implies that they're spying on you. They don't care don't care about you. I got bad news. They really don't. <laughs> I don't trust any of these so-called privacy testing. Going, baby. Hey. Hey, me just met you. <laughs> And this is crazy, but you got cookies. Cookies. It's hard to look at your snack, baby. <laughs> you it's the cookie, cookie monster tracking you everywhere you go. Hey, Leo Laporte, the tech crazy, guy. 88. I know I'm tilting at windmills, but I just, I try, I really uh, think that the nomenclature used to describe this kind of stuff really impacts how people feel about it. And I don't think... It's really what you think it is. But I know every time I, I talk about tracking cookies and suggest they should be called ad personalization settings, things like that, people go, no, but that's not, but they're following me around. Nobody's following. They don't even care about you. Zach, Gilbert, Arizona, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, thanks for taking my call. Nice to talk to you. Thanks for hanging on. No problem. Two, uh, two quick questions for you. Um, I want to upgrade the solid, uh, the the normal hard drive to a solid state hard drive in a laptop to get a little more speed out of it. Yeah, it makes a big difference. <clears throat> I'm previewing. I'm browsing around Newegg, looking at different brands and models and stuff. And I've heard you mention uh, that you liked the Intel drives in the past. That's just, changed I'm... a little bit. Oh, okay. So let me give you let me give you a, talk a little bit about this. So first of all, most hard drives up to now have been spinning, right? They have a spinning platters and an arm that records. They're kind of like magnetic m media, just really, really fast and really, really dense. And that's been a very successful model, much more so than I thought. I mean, in 2000, I predicted the demise of the hard drive industry by 2005. I was so wrong. And one thing that we didn't predict is how good they'd get at packing more and more data on a, on a single drive. We're up to three terabyte hard drives now. It's unimaginable. But hard drives have some inherent problems. One is that uh, the data is stored on, in a variety of places on the disk, and the hard drive is not random access. It's sequential access. It actually has to move the head to that place. So that slows it down. It's, it's searching around. It's seeking. That's one of the reasons you have to drive optimize, right? You, have to, you want to get everything kind of in the same place to speed things up. But even that doesn't solve the problem because the drive's spinning. So the head can read it, but then it has to wait till it spins around again to read the next thing. So that's called drive latency. There's all sorts of reasons why spinning hard drives are not super fast. They're not. They're they're speed limited. Solid state drives are just exactly the same as compact flash or, the, you know, the memory in your camera or um, the memory in your phone. There's no moving parts. A, we like that because you know moving parts are hot and can break. But B, they're random access. 
So it's it's instantaneous to access any part of the hard drive. The technology's improved quite a bit, uh, and now you're getting uh, solid-state drives that are very, very fast, much, much faster, both read and write, than hard drives. Write slower than read. Reading's almost instantaneous. It's really, really fast. Writing is slower because it has to electrically change the state of the memory cell on that thing, and that just takes a little bit of time. So writing is slow, usually less than half as fast as reading on a solid-state drive. Now, there's other factors, though. What is that solid-state drive connecting to? You know, I uh, somebody asked me on Twitter today, hey, I know you put a solid-state drive in your netbook. Did it help? It did not help much because the netbook had very slow data buses. So it's not just how fast it can get the data, but how fast that data can be transferred into memory so that the CPU can access it. And that was slow on that thing, so I didn't get the benefit. So the first thing to make sure, Zach, is that you have hardware that can take advantage of it. If you're on SATA, especially if you're on a modern, you know, SATA 3 or SATA 6, then you'll really be able to take advantage of it. If you're on earlier SATA or IDE, you may not be able to take advantage of it. So you want to make sure you have uh, at, at least 3 gigabit per second SATA connections, 6 gigabits if possible, because you'll actually use all that speed. Then, before you go buy an SSD... Visit a website called PC Perspective. That's P-C-P-E-R dot com. My friend Alan Malventano, who has been my personal hard solid-state hard drive guru, has something, and you'll see it right at the top of the page, the SSD decoder. And he's been keeping this up to date since 2009. Lots of updates about the different speeds. But, you know, it's literally a table, but you could just look at his picks. And he actually likes for high-end OCZ. What, do you, what you're looking for is a SandForce controller or an Intel controller, but a SandForce controller. And he, so he has his choices here. He does recommend if, if money is no object and you're doing a high-end desktop that can take advantage of the ultimate speed like SATA 6 gigabits, he does recommend the Intel uh, drives. But you've got to read this article because it talks about all of the things you need to know. And you don't need to necessarily spend as much, if it, depending on your connector. Great. Okay. Uh, Does that help? A little money then, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, the Intels are great. The, you, the problem with SSD is it's expensive for the capacity, right? It's much more expensive than a, than a spinning drive. Um, sure. So, so generally my recommendation is to get a smaller SSD drive as the boot drive, if you have this luxury. And then you can have a large spinning drive for your data drive. You'll get 90% of the benefit. Uh, but you'll also have data storage, so the cost will be less. I actually uh, I put SSD in all my new computers now. I, I, I'm so spoiled by the you know 15-second boot times, almost instantaneous uh, data reading. And the, tr the prices are drive driving down, coming much, much, much smaller. Okay, Zach? Great, thank you. Uh, uh, quick second question, I guess. Sure. Uh, I'm also considering an ultrabook, and I just kind of, I'm kind of leaning toward the Asus ZenBooks. I just got, I just got it. It's beautiful. Awesome. Yeah, it's so funny because it has a sticker on it that says "Inspired by Intel," and what they should probably say is "Inspired by Intel," who was inspired by Apple, because it's really a direct clone of a MacBook Air. It's just running yeah. Windows. Similar. Yeah, they're really similar. Uh, I have I've been reviewing the uh, the new Asus uh, uh, ZenBook. It's beautiful. If yeah, if you want a Windows Ultrabook, that's the one. Great. Thanks for the recommendation. My it. my pleasure, Zach. Thanks for calling. And then of course it has a solid state drive. All the Ultrabooks, the MacBook Airs, all those ultra thin ones uh, have solid state drives because you it's a premium priced laptop, and so you want pre premium performance. There are such things as hybrid drives, where they have a little solid state, a little spinning. Uh, read Alan's reviews. At, I haven't read the re most recent reviews, but uh, I've read his previous reviews in, uh, on PC Perspective, in which he says they are not, not good, that he does not recommend those. Do your own hybrid if you have the space. Some laptops now are doing it, many desktops. Uh, my desktop, the, uh, the iMac I'm sitting in front of, has two drives in it. It has a solid state boot drive and then a spinning hard drive internally for lots of data. And that's a nice, that's a really nice uh, kind of middle-of-the-road solution. A little expensive. You pay the price for that. 
Frank, Canoga Park, California. You're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Frank. You know, I have a problem that um, I use uh, Microsoft uh, Security and uh, Essentials, and uh, my firewall always turns on when I turn on my computer. The first thing I to go to firewall and reset it. You don't like a firewall? Yes. It's the Windows firewall, or do you have a third-party firewall? The Windows firewall. You want to keep it on, right? Yes, uh, but it turns off. Oh. Hmm. Let me think about this. We're going to take a break. We'll come back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Why is this firewall going off? I think that sounds like malware, doesn't it? can't think of a good reason for that. Hey, I just met you, but I love you. Share file. You're the best. Have we talked about I haven't done that. I am a big fan of ShareFile. At first, I was a little skeptical. ShareFile is um, a Citrix product, brand new product from Citrix. It's designed to make it easy to share large files in a business setting without um, any of the compromises some of the com- you know some of the consumer grade products have. And I confess, I was using one of those consumer grade products I, for a long time. With all sorts of issues. We talked a little bit about this. My biggest problem was I would use it to send ads to the radio station and then they would delete them because they had access to it. And it's like, no, no, don't. He said, but it takes up space in my heart. Don't delete. So I'll tell you, item one I love about ShareFile. You can share a file with somebody. They have an Outlook plugin. So it looks just like email. But they don't have to sign up for ShareFile to see it. That's huge. All the other services, oh, you got to be a member. Yeah, you get a free account, but you got to be a member. So I'm going to log into my ShareFile account here. We have, and by the way, here's another really nice feature. It's customized for your business. So you see we have the Twit logo. I mean, it really is pro-looking. And I'll show you how simple it is to set. Now, if, if I had the Outlook pl- pl- plug-in, it would just be an email attachment, except it's not. It's, you know, it's a ShareFile. But you don't even have to do that. So let's say, okay, here's an ad I sent. Uh, these are, this is how I send the ads to the radio stations, for instance. So here's, a, here's an ad. I check the box and I press send. Now, a couple of things. One, I can make an email right within the ShareFile interface, but this is how I like to do it. I create a link that I can copy and send using my own email software. And again, if you have the plugin, you don't have to go through this. Email me when the item's been downloaded. But I show you this so you can see all the settings. Email me when the item's been downloaded. You get that choice. You can require recipients to enter a name and email before download. What happened? Did I? Was that me? Oh, my. It's just my monitor's resetting. Okay. Thank you, whatever. Somebody's doing something out there. Require recipients to enter name and email before downloading. Download access expires, and you could say never after a year six. This is so cool. You can, with, you can re- withdraw, you know, you can withdraw permission to get it. How many times they can download it. And then send file, and then I'll get a link. And now this link, and I'll just paste it in so you'll see, they don't have to sign up for share file. They just click that link in the email, and there it is. There's their file professionally presented 100 percent secure it's a uh, hipaa compliant compliant with standards and regulations in almost every industry i want you to try it free for 30 days this is if you're in business if you're a physician and you're sharing medical records if if you're sharing documents drawings powerpoints this is the way to do it sharefile.com and the promo code when you sign up is tech guy that'll get you 30 days free i do this is how i share files now and it's been such a relief automatic synchronization you know like uh so, you know, I have the share file folders on my desktop. I should show you this. Where is it? I have the share file folders on my desktop. Anything I put in here is automatically synchronized. So I send them a folder link and they can automatically get it. Um, it's just so sweet. Sharefile.com. Give it a try. I love it. Wait a minute. That's the wrong. What's going on? There it is. That's the wrong picture. There it is. So I'll show you again. This is my share file folder for Premiere. I drag something in here, it automatically syncs. I have this is the share file desktop for Mac. They have one for Windows. I think they have one for Linux as well. Very cool. Bob. The Albert skates have not shut up. They better show up quick. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 
All right, we were talking to Frank in Canoga Park. So he has Microsoft Security Essentials. Good man, Frank. That's a, 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 a for, for of all the free antiviruses, that's the one I recommend. It's from Microsoft. Uh, I think that? it's going to be part of Windows 8. Normally, when you put Security Essentials on your computer, it turns the fire the Windows firewall on. When you first install it, it has a checkbox that says, you want me to turn on the Windows firewall when you boot. So I'm a little nervous that you boot and something's turning your firewall off. Do you have another security package or firewall installed on that system? No, I don't. And not only that, uh, I, I think you have to have the DNA. That's always checked on. I, I try to uh, uh, um, make no exceptions, you know. And uh, I, I, and You mean DNS? I, it, uh, DNA is always there. What's DNA? Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that uh, for the uh, for uh, XP to work, it needs DNA there. So it's, uh, there's different functions that it, it uh, correlates and uh, connects to. I don't know what so, DNA is, but I don't, it doesn't sound good. You're not, you know, you mean DNS? Oh, uh, well, I thought it was DNA. I'm not looking at it. Now, okay, I think I. Uh, yeah, <laughs> DLNA yeah, is what connects to your TV. Anyway. Um, when, you, when you go into a, it has general, then it has exceptions. When you go to the exceptions. It's normal box, to have exceptions. There will be exceptions put in there for a variety of things. If you have an Xbox, for instance, or D, I think it's DLNA is what you're talking about, which allows you to play videos on your TV, right? Well, I thought it was like DNA, like the. Uh, like your g genetic... Uh... Yeah, well, I don't know what that one is. But it is normal um, is normal to have exceptions in your firewall. One other thing happened to me. Uh, well, I was sending some... I usually send uh, forward emails uh, when they're jokes or, you know, pictures or something, blind copy. And then I noticed that in the boxes said to carbon copy, something came up that I never put in there. Yeah, I'm a little nervous that you might have some malware on there, Frank. One of the things that happens when you get bad guys on your system is they start to disable things that protect you. So turning off the firewall is exactly what malware would do. It also would make it difficult for you to go to an antivirus site. So sometimes... I, I, another thing is I, you know, I run a, a, a scan all the time, and it doesn't... It must there must be some something out there that that uh, they're not aware of that uh, some Well, malware. that can happen. Yeah, malware sometimes um, gets around common uh, antiviruses. But I'm not sure that you have malware, but I'm a little nervous because I'm hearing what I'm hearing could be symptomatic of it. Um, here's just one thing that everybody who uses Windows can do. What version of Windows are you running? Uh, XP? XP? Yeah. Um, and you keep it up to date, right? You run Windows Update regularly? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, good. It's Good man. So you have something, when you do Windows Update, it's updated every month, second Tuesday of every month. It's called MRT, the Malicious Software Removal Tool. MRT. MRT. Yeah, and that's already on your system. So, But it doesn't, when you do the update, it doesn't normally do a thorough scan. So I'm going to have you do a thorough scan. So the way you do it is uh, you, you open a command line. You got There's no icon and there's no menu item for MRT. Microsoft, in their infinite wisdom, has decided not to put one there, even though it's easy to do. So click Start, and if you have a run item in your Start menu, click that, and then type MRT okay. Return. Right. And uh, what that will do is run, you'll see a program run, and, and do a thorough scan. What that, that's updated, it's not really an antivirus. It's really designed to uh, remove common malware. It beca it's became such an issue on Windows that Microsoft started distributing this, and every month they update it with new malware information. So I would check to see if uh, MRT and do a thorough scan, which take a little time, not not a huge amount of time, but take a little time. I would check to see if it finds anything. What about uh, adding some other? Uh, uh, yeah, this uh, this is another thing I would recommend. Uh, other, you know, in combination with. Uh, well, you don't really want to run more than one antivirus. So any antivirus that you try to install will uninstall Security Essentials. They don't. They can't. Oh. Two, you can't run two at once, but you can do it. What's called an online scan. So what I'm going to suggest 
is that you visit our sponsor's site, ESET.com. Oh, would you repeat that? ESET.com. They're one of a number of them, but they have an online scanner that you okay. can just run. You'll probably want to do this in Internet Explorer. Uh, and you just run it. You'll find if you if you go to ESET.com, you'll find the online scanner in the quick links on the right. And uh, the online scanner, you'll run it, and it will also do a virus scan without installing anything. And it will give you some sense of how safe you are. This is a good company. I like their stuff. As you know, they're a sponsor. You can run this scanner on your system, and it just uses your browser to do it. Uh, so I think it's a uh, what I'm what I'm doing here, Frank, is it get, getting you some second opinions, first from right. them from MRT and then from ESET. If both of them come up clean, then there's something else going on. It's a settings issue or something like that. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to try both of those, and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, they're good tools to know about. Um, and you know, whenever things like that, whenever things all of a sudden happen that kind of don't seem right then uh then then that's when i start to say hmm, let's check and make sure we don't have a virus so uh, net support dna the windows firewall is to f- will block all network activity produced by net support dna somebody in the chat room has found something called dna net support what is net support um uh, i don't know what it is but uh maybe that's something you have installed on your system uh, and so it could be uh, it could be that that the firewall was blocking it, and net support is is uh, is fixing. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, I thought of that, that. But the point is that if I have DNA and I don't have a firewall, I don't. I agree. Going. You don't want it. Oh, <laughs> it, it. Net support is for classroom management. You don't. You don't. T- do you teach? Are you doing a? It, did you ever have this installed in a classroom? Asset no. management, net support, a complete asset management anywhere. Do you have a, an IT guy? Is this a was this a computer that was used in a business? No, it's uh, my personal computer. Yeah. I've never... I don't think you should have this on there. So, I don't think that's what we're. This is what I. This is what the chat room found in terms of DNA. It's uh, it's for IT an IT department. I don't I don't think this is what you, I don't think this is on your system. I would run oh. those scanners, Frank. I think that's the best bet. Let's just make sure you don't have a virus on there. And then if uh, if they come up clean, then at least you don't have to worry about that, and you can kind of figure out, well, what's going on with my settings? You might uninstall and reinstall Security Essentials. That's probably what would, would uh, be the first thing I would do, because Security Essentials does enable the Windows firewall. Good luck, Frank, and I'm sorry that uh, I don't have a better answer for you, but that's a start anyway. Ben in Cleveland, Ohio. Hello, Ben. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. How you doing? I'm well, Ben. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, I actually have two quick questions for you. Um, I saw your headphones on the live stream. Yes. I really liked them. I was wondering, like, what they were. I love them. I love them. All right. Well, hang on. I'll. That's a good tease. <laughs> I'll talk about headphones and which ones I recommend when I come back. Leo Laporte, <laughs> the tech guy. Uh, I don't think he had net support uh, DNA on there. That's, it says his personal computer. I don't know what that was. If you're running a small business, is. you can't operate at anything less than full speed these days. That's the why you're the world's fastest the two-sided DNS, inkjet the printer, the Epson the Workforce. I love the Workforce Pro. Uh, you guys get something to eat? I was afraid you left. I thought, oh, no. Oh, you got the tour. Oh, good. You got to see the basement. Isn't that cool down there? Yeah. I'm so proud of this. I love this place. This is like the best little toy store. I just love it. It's a fun place to work. I've worked in so many radio studios that are so depressing. And this is just a... a well, this is my office. But, uh, but it's also just fun. I just really enjoy working here. Mm, I love China. Where, where in China are you from? Oh, Korean. Okay. Um, they had a language requirement. And I took ancient Greek first. And it was horrible. I couldn't keep up. So um, 
I said, screw that. <laughs> and I took Chinese. I think it was my second semester freshman year. And it was great. It was intensive Chinese. It was, it was two hours a day, five days a week um, with Chinese speakers. And it was great. I really loved it. And then I, and I fell in love with the culture. And so the Chinese studies major was a history major, but you had to learn the language. And it was great. But this was in 73 and 74 was when we were just starting to open the door to China. And um, so I never, you know, if they had exchange programs, but you'd like work in a commune. It was like the Cultural Revolution. It was not a good time to go to China. So I never went. Um, And then I found radio and fell in love with that. But I never lost my love for the culture. And so I took my son to China in 2009. It was so amazing. I just loved it. It really resonated for me. And I remembered enough Chinese that I was kind of understanding what was going on. It was just, I just, I love it. I really love it. There's something about the culture. It's ain't, it's so ancient. And I just find that fascinating. To have a 3,500-year-old written history is amazing. Um, and I think it's a very sophisticated, interesting culture. And, of course, Korea and Japan and everywhere has been inf- heavily influenced by it. I mean, it, basically, it's all the sphere of influence, so... I found it very interesting. I've been to Korea. I've been to um, uh, Jeju. It was fun. Yeah, it was really fun. Uh, Henry and I went to Korea. That was the same trip. Yeah, it was really fun. I mean, we didn't we didn't get to go to uh, the mainland, just that island, but it was really great. Jeju. Yeah. Is, have you ever vacationed there? It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So that was fun. I yeah. I want to go back to Japan. I want to go back to Korea. I want to go to Vietnam. I've I've. I, I'm fascinated with Asia. I've been to Singapore and really loved it. Um, I would love to. Well, when I retire, that's my goal is just to just to travel nonstop. I want to get a boat <laughs> and just sail around the world all the time. Yeah, he's been advising me. He's been giving me boat advice. Um he, uh, he he said, "Look at a tugboat trawler." So I did, and they're they're great because they have like they hold like five thousand gallons of gas or something, and you can go, you know, it, thousands and thousands of miles. They're kind of designed so that you could go across the Atlantic without a refill. You have to be able to go across an ocean, obviously. Um. <laughs> well, you can get a big enough boat that you can live on it. So I don't know if I'll do that, but I would love to. I would love to have a liveaboard boat and just kind of putt putt around the world. I'll be too old by the time I retire. I'll be too old to do that. <laughs> I'll just I'll just want to go to bed every night, you know, all day. Yeah, well, I well, you know, that's why I got the ham license. I want to be able to do all that. If you like the music Kyle plays, he's great. Kyle Benham, our musical director. You can uh, find his playlist on his Google Plus account right after every show. K Y L E space B E N H A M. Uh, but you can also uh, find it on our website, our brand new website, techguylabs.com. They've actually got a really nice looking uh, playlist set up there at the bottom of every uh, show. I hope you've used the new website. Have you checked it out? We spent a lot of money redesigning that. It'd be a, sh- it'd be a shame if nobody if nobody ever visited it. Techguylabs.com. We're still working out some of the bugs and stuff. We've got uh, the tip of the week there, the hero of the month, question of the week. You can pick an episode, a recent episode, and, and uh, read up on all the questions I answered. Watch the video. It's cool. And, you know, the thing I really want you to do, if you can, is comment. So if you read a question and you go, you know, I don't know if Leo gave the best answer, add a comment. And if you don't have to add a comment. You can also vote on a comment. And the highest voting ranking comments should go to the top there. Um. So this is this is a great way for you. I know a lot of times people listen to this show not because they love it, because they want to yell at me. <laughs> you're wrong! So if you're one of those people who's been talking back to the radio, now there's a place for you. TechGuyLabs.com. We also put all of the uh, audio and video from every show there so you can, if you miss a show, there's, we're, you know what, is this, tomorrow is my 900th episode. Wow! This is eight ninety nine. Wow! It's also a list of stations there and everything. And I know, you know, uh, there's other uh, tech shows that maybe, uh, in order to find out what station they're on, for instance, you have to give them an email address. I'm not collecting. I'm not harvesting your email. Everything's free. It's all. It's ad supported. I like that the best, frankly. I think that's the best way to do uh, 
to do things. Let's give it away. Let everybody listen to it anywhere, anytime. And we've got some great advertisers who, uh, who support it. And that works out pretty well, I think. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's another way you can support the show, by just calling in. And if you hear a question, you disagree, and you, you want to fix it, go to the website, techguylabs.com. All right, we were talking to Ben in Cleveland and uh, home of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Have you been there, Ben? Uh, no, I have not. Of course not. Nobody in San Francisco has been to Alcatraz either. I don't know why that is. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? I've been there. I love it. It's a really beautiful <laughs> building, and it's just cool to see all that stuff. Anyway, you were asking about the headphones, and, um, you know, the, you, if you look, if you watch recording studio sessions, you'll see these headphones all the time. Uh, they're, they're kind of the, the most popular headphones in uh, studios. And uh, I, I fell in love with them in radio uh, after using them for years. They're from a company called AKG, and they're called the AKG K240s. These are the kind of a, a little bit higher-end K240. These are the reference design. AKG is a uh, an Austrian company. And, you know, the main reason I wear them is not for accuracy, although I'm told they're quite, you know, accurate. They sound good. Uh, but just they're comfortable. You can wear them all day. But I do love these. These are my favorite headphones, absolutely. AKG K240s. I think they're a couple of, maybe $250, $300 a pair. They're not cheap. Good headphones are more expensive than you'd think. When I fly, when I drive, um, I don't wear headphones like this. It wouldn't be legal to drive with headphones like this, by the way. Um, On an airplane, I guess you could. But I want something a little more compact. I use Etymotix. E-T-Y-M-O-T-I-C-S. Uh, these are what we call in-ear monitors, or IEMs. Now, this th- I think this is an acquired taste. Instead of, uh, um, as my current headphones do, sitting over the ears, these go into your ears. If you have a, a, a gag reflex, which, which I do, sometimes you go, <laughs> when you stick it. <laughs> but I really like the, uh, I think these are very accurate. And because they're in-ear, the bass is really good. They also have, and I, I want to recommend this, an, a kid's headset. Etymotics for kids that have an automatic limit on them to protect kids' ears. Headphones can really deafen you. And I think we have a whole generation of kids growing up who have damaged their hearing. Oh, but we've brought the Etymotics site down. Everybody went there at once. If it's a little slow, go back later. But the Etymotics for kids um, are engineered to limit the sound output so that you can't hurt your ears, which I think is such a good idea. So if you're getting, uh, don't use those earbuds that come with your iPhone or your iPod. They're terrible, terrible quality, and they can deafen you. Get these, uh, get these, they're a little bit better uh, quality, a lot better quality, and they can protect your ears. So so for airplanes, I don't use sound canceling or noise canceling uh, headphones like the Bose. I use in-ear headphones. They seal out the noise so you don't hear anything, and they give you much more accurate uh, audio response. I really like them. You said you had two questions. What's the other? Yeah, and I was also wondering, what is your favorite Olympic sport in the 2012 Oh, summer? wow. It's been fun watching. Have you been watching? I have been watching. It's really, it's great. I don't know. Let's see. I really enjoy, I've been watching the diving, and the platform diving just blows me away. Those things are so high. They're so brave, those divers. And they are really all-round athletes. You think, well, how, you don't have to be an athlete to jump into a pool. Oh, yes, you do. They're gymnasts, and they're amazing. So I really enjoyed watching that. Um, I loved... Watching Jessica Ennis, the British runner, win the heptathlon. Uh, I'm, I'm so impressed by the uh, decathletes and the heptathletes because they have to do, you know, hurdles, shot put, javelin, discus, running. They have to do it all. And they're such yeah. athletes. So I really enjoy it. What's, what's your favorite? Uh, my favorite is gymnastics. I always liked well, flying in the and air. After all, Gabby, I mean, my goodness. In fact, our whole gymnastics team, the fab, what do they call them, the Fabulous Five? They've been inc- yeah. They've been incredible. <laughs> Is that your wife or girlfriend? I guess she agrees. <laughs> and Allie was so amazing. I just you're right. You just really enjoy uh watching these people and and they work for years for 10 seconds. And that that always blows me away. The dedication, the drive and the ability You know, there's a wonderful, I think I saw it on Google+. Plus. There's a wonderful video comparing the winner of the 19, was it 1958 
vaulting medal, gold medal in vaulting. You know, that's the one where they run, jump, and boing, they go, they land on the vault, and then they, the horse, and they come off. And they compared the 1958 uh, vaulting gold medal, which was basically that: run, jump in the air, put your hands on the vaulting horse, go over and spike it. With the with uh, Gabby's amazing gold medal performance this year. In which she runs, jumps, does like 800 somersaults, twists, like she's flying and then lands. And I don't know what's happened between 1958 and 2012, but something. They're, they're putting some in the Wheaties. Wow. I guess it's a, it's a testament to training, our understanding of nutrition and, and uh, kinesthesiology, and also to the willingness of, of some countries like uh, the U.S., to have professional Olympic athletes, who that's all they do. That's all they do, full time. 8888 Ask Leo. Thanks for the call, Ben. Lawrence, Oceanside, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi hey, there. Hey, Lawrence. Thanks for calling. What can I do for you? Thanks. I am, every year I make a slideshow of my trips using Apple. And this year I decided to include movies that I've taken on my camera. Yeah. But I've gotten all this wind noise that I just want to eliminate sound that was recorded so right. that I can include the music sound. Right. And I don't know how to do that. I'm, I can't Are you on it. Windows or Mac? I'm on a Mac. And okay. So the first I thing I would movie. do is I would import, and I would do this anyway, I'd import the audio, the um, video into or edit it in, uh, you have it, it comes with the Macintosh iMovie, and you can remove the soundtrack, or you can remix it. You can also, it's easier to edit it there, and then import it into iPhoto and make the slideshow. But it's... I, I actually, I took the video and I put it in iMovie, and I was able to take off the sound, yeah. but then when I tried to export it, I got something that was much smaller Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So look at your export settings. You can't just take the default export settings. Look at the export settings and make sure you're doing it in, in highest possible quality. That's what happened. It, it squinched it. It squinched it down. You don't want it squinched down. <laughs> you may even be able to, they're saying, uh, Josh in our chat room says, you know, it's easy to uh, to squish the wind noise. It's, it's around 200 to 250 hertz. So another way to do this would be open an equalizer on it and uh, cut it. Uh, at that, at that, those frequencies, 200 to 250 hertz. Cut it down, he says, about 6 dB. And uh, you'll still be able to hear the other audio without the wind noise. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Do, 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 do. Techguylabs.com, 4457. It's all there. The brand new techguylabs.com. From Premier Radio Network. So nice to see you. Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye bye. On the college tour, we get a lot of. It's fun. We get a lot of uh, kids who are uh, around this time of year, actually all year round, who are doing the college tours. What can I do for you, Alan? Ah, basketball, U.S. France. How could France have a good basketball team? <laughs> I know, isn't that silly? Ah, how many interns do we have? We've got Alan. We've got Matthew. We've got Mario. We've got Eli. We have at least four interns. They're all uh, high school or college age. Who else? I think that's it. Four interns. Matthew, Mario, Alan, Eli. Anyway, roughly that many. Yeah. There are no there aren't really any um big schools around here. Sonoma State is very is here and is big. It, you know, is a popular school. Um there's the junior college, but but really um there's no there's no universities per se in the uh, in the area. No, I mean, there. It's either the state college or the uh, junior college, community college. Cal's in probably the nearest University of California. There's University of San Francisco, UCSF. You know, 
Yeah, Becky, we you could you have to be under eighty years old if you want to be an intern. Anybody could intern here. I'll even take an eighty year old. Oh, we gotta get do I have to get the whiskeys? I also have to do an ad, don't I? We do I think there's some interns still living in the basement. I don't know where they went. They just disappeared. We do have a people greeter. Uh, Greg Barnett is going to be our people greeter. You can intern from New York if you move here. I know. I can't believe Petalum is doing so well in the Little League World Series. Yay. This is Premier Channel 7. Leo Laporte. <laughs> yeah, we need a breeder. <laughs> From Premier Radio Network. Love Point Reyes to Can Monkey. It's beautiful out there. Same old salad as always. It's always the same salad. I think it's working, though. Right? Even Dr. Mom, you got to agree. Pretty good health. You're tuned to Premier Channel 7. Leo Laporte. Losing weight, feeling Scott. good. We'll begin at six minutes past the hour from Premier Radio Networks. We don't do this week in Twitter on Saturdays anymore. Um, we do it Wednesdays from time to time. Because Flash is a pig. It's poorly designed, I think. Wednesday, you're going to give me an on-air physical? You know, I haven't got... I keep, putting off my blood work. I'll get my blood work done on Monday. Maybe it'll be in by Wednesday. You can go over it with me. Okay, I promise. Monday, I will go in and get my blood work done. And I'm getting a CRP, which is uh, the measurement of inflammation. I'm not getting a VAP. I forgot to ask for a VAP. CMP, I don't know. I just asked for a CRP. On the yeah, PSA, of course. Well, a good day to you, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. And it's time to talk about... Well, you know, tech. And the Olympics, too, if you want. Computers, the internet, cell phones, camcorders, MP3 players, home theater, all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO is the website. 888-827-5536. Our website is techguylabs.com. Check it out. Uh, this is where you can find uh, the show notes. We have 899 shows online now. You can watch live. You can uh, watch after the fact. We put video and audio up. It's The main purpose, though, of this website, and it's absolutely free. There's no paid subscription of any kind. It's all free. To me, the main purpose of this website is, uh, besides replacing the 1998 vintage website that we had before, is to make it easier to find information, things I talk about. Um. Because I know people listen, and you're in your car, you're driving around, you hear something with half a, half an ear, and then you go, oh, well, we, something. And I get that's mostly what the email I get is, you mentioned something about. So the first place to check, I mean, I'll email you back if I, if I can. I mean, I get an awful lot of email. But really, the best thing to do is go search the website. We have a very good search on there. And uh, you can also look at show by show. You can go topic by topic. You can go question by question. I'm I'm really proud of this, and I thank uh, our uh, web designers, the company Lullabot, who did such a great job with this. Jeff Eaton was the architect, Jared Poncho, the uh, designer. Uh, thanks also to James DeRuvo, who takes these show notes and has been for almost all of the 899 episodes, and Josh Windish, who is our in-house uh, guy. And he'll be, uh, Josh is going to start answering the Tech Guy Lab's email. 
help me out with that. And he, you know, he listens to every show. So in some ways he knows better than I <laughs> what I talked about. I'm barely here, you don't understand. 8888 <laughs> ask Leo, that's the phone number. 888-827-5536. You'll also find a link there to our uh, chat room. And uh, that's right on the front page there. Right under my picture. I know not a great picture. I'm going to work on getting a better one in there. But there's a link directly to the chat room there and to the phone number. And the chat room's fun. The chat room's a place that uh, you can go and hang out with other people. I was in our chat room when the Curiosity landed on Mars on Sunday night. And there were a thousand people in there. And we were all just excited, giddy, f- enjoying ourselves. That's, to me, this is a, this, this is like a, I don't know. It's like a um, a party that's just constant, always going on, and we and it's heavily moderated. We have really good moderators. They're all volunteers. Dan and uh, Brad's in there, and uh, Canuck and CWBP and Darth Emmon, Houdini Seven and Knox Harrington and Life's a Zoo and Marmot and Mick and Night Flyer and Tex, and they're all in there, and they do a really good job of keeping things uh, family friendly, safe. I see Dick D. Bartolo, the Gizwiz is in there. He's going to join us a little bit, talk about gadgets. Members of my staff are also in there. So if you have questions about the Tech Guy Labs, you could get them answered there. And then there's usually seven, eight hundred, sometimes as many as a thousand other people uh, just hanging out, chatting, having a good time. I'm really, I'm really think this is a great adjunct to uh, what we do. TechGuyLabs.com. You'll find it all there. Back to the phones we go. 8888 Ask Leo. Zane is in Houston. Hey, Zane, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Hi. Um, I'm in the market to buy a DSLR camera right now. Okay. And I've been checking out the Sony Alpha 65 and just kind of wanted to know what you thought about it. You know, I've never used it, I and uh, and I'm a little bigoted and biased. Um, but the reviews, I think, are very good. I would I would visit dpreview.com and digitalcamerainfo.com and read the reviews there so you know what you're getting into. Um, okay. I am biased toward, when it comes to DSLRs, now I think I do recommend the Sony mirrorless cameras, the NEX series. But when it comes to digital single lens reflex, that is cameras that you look through the lens, I'm old school. I I, uh, I feel that Nikon and Canon are the choices to go with. Sony's kind of an upstart, a newcomer, and uh, I think they make very good cameras. I I have no reason not to think so. But I just I I like one of the things you you have to understand is when you choose a DSLR, you're choosing more than the camera body. You're choosing a company because you're going to probably spend more money on the lenses over time than you do on the camera itself. DSLRs are interchangeable lens cameras, and the glass can be quite expensive. So really what you're saying is, I'm going to choose Sony glass. Not necessarily I'm choosing Sony, the camera body. Because the bodies get better and better, but the glass glass is kind of uh, old school. So I... To me, I like Nikon and Canon glass, so that's why I buy Nikon or Canon. Uh, I'm actually a Canon shooter, but I don't, I don't know if there's any, you know, reason not to buy a Sony camera. I think there, uh, everybody uh, seems to think quite highly of them. Um, you might look at Minolta, which I think is related somehow in some bizarre way to the Sony cameras. I have another question too. Sure. Uh, when it comes to SD cards. There's the different classes, right? Right. Are the class 10s worth it? Like, is it worth it to get Well, that's a, that depends on the camera. So class 10 is faster, right? Yeah. Uh, and so that's what the class means is, is its throughput. So uh, it's no, there's no point in buying a uh, SD card that's faster than your camera. Um, yeah. So that's, so that's what you have to find out is what can the camera support. So, uh, uh, you know, I can give you the speeds and feeds of, of what each is, but what you really need to do, and this you're going to have to dig through the cam- camera documentation to uh, figure out, that's what's really uh, the issue. I always buy Class 10 because, you know, I figure that's the fastest and it's going to give me uh, the fastest speed. Class 10 is 10 megabit, megabytes, I'm sorry, per second. 
That's what that's what the ten means. Two is two megabytes, four is four meg, and so on. Um, but if your camera doesn't write at ten megabytes per second, you're buying more card than you need. So check. But I would guess that you should go with ten. It is worth it because and here's the difference: it's the quality of video. Uh, if you're if the if the SD card can't keep up with high def video, you won't be able to record in high def. It's also how many shots you can take in burst mode. Because what you'll have, what you'll see is you press the button down, and it's shooting in burst mode, and it will take pictures until it's it can't keep up. The card can't keep up, and now it has to wait for the card to write, because there's only a certain amount of buffer in the camera. So a faster card means you could take more images, or you'll get back to taking burst mode images sooner. Right. So, so that's that's when it makes a difference. Class ten cards are not better in any other way; they're just faster. Yeah. All right. Hey Zane, good luck. Is this your uh, is this your first digital uh, SLR? Is this your step up? Uh, yep. It's exciting. It's a great. I love photography. It's a wonderful hobby. And get the best camera you can afford, but don't worry so much about it because it's it's uh, it's not the camera. It's the photographer, isn't it? It's All just right. it's just nice to have a nice tool if you can. You know, but to, truth to tell, there's some great uh, the, the the camera you're looking at is about a thousand dollars. Um, I would probably look first at a Nikon D3200, which is about three or 400 bucks less. You could get then two really good lenses and the camera for the same price. I really like the D3200. Nikon just outdid itself for an entry-level camera. 8888 Ask Leo. That's the, uh, that's the number to call. Good luck with your, uh, with your hobby, Zach. I really, uh, it's, you're going to love it. Jerry, Bristol, Florida. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, dang, damn it. Hold on, Jerry. Hold on. You're going to be back in uh, just a second. You'll be our first caller after this break. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, there's this new UHS. What is it called? The uh, U Ultra High Speed. If you're a sysadmin man or you're in IT, you know the classic juggling act. How do you keep your company's systems running reliably? There are Thunderbolt card readers, Lawn Dog. You'd have to have a very fast memory to use it. Uh, I'm using Textual. That's Textual. You're right. We got. I meant to link back to the forums. I apologize. I will uh, talk to Josh or Spiro about uh, doing that. Going to the post office to send out your letters and packages. I have not tried and time is money. So I use the um, any Nikon cameras. And never go to the post office. You won't ever have to go ever again. The Isn't that AeroPress great, Jetta Joey? Man, that's the best deal in coffee making. For any letter or package using your computer, your printer, no special links, no postage. I think I think they're probably all using specialized buses. I don't know what they're using in the card. There's no guesswork. As usual, as always, uh, many of our shows brought to you, as you know, by Ford Motor Company. I am a Ford fan. I have a blue oval. I get my car. There it is, that 2010 Mustang. I love my Mustang GT 5.0 with the Ford Sync. But I have to admit, now am I in the newer Ford vehicles. I had 20, that 2013 Ford Focus Electric. Next year, I guess that's the 2012, isn't it? Next year's the 2013 Energy, the Ford Fusion with the plug-in hybrid. I am, I'm just, you know, I had a chance uh, to talk to uh, Ford technologist Jim Butchkowski, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. He's, he's one of the guys res responsible for the sync platform. He, we talked a little bit about what they're doing. The whole idea, again, and I mentioned this before, the whole idea uh, Ford has is that the car should be a platform that developers develop for. So they are adding services to the platform like 
location-based services, friend finding, financial services. This is all going to be part of the Sync platform. New apps coming. Uh, he couldn't tell me in too many details. He gave me the categories. He didn't want to name names. But these are, in most cases, third-party apps. The more and more developers are writing applications to the Sync AppLink API to develop the platform. It's very exciting. And Ford wants to hear your ideas. I'm going to show you a website in a little bit where you can where you can interact with them and say what you'd like to see next in uh, Ford vehicles. The future of speech-to-text, uh, seamless local and cloud processing. So right now it's uh, processed locally, but they also will add uh, cloud processing, which will give you a much larger variety of things you can say. The GPS Scout by Telenav. This is sweet. Sweet stuff. And they're adding technologies uh, to the car. We mentioned this before, making it more and more like, I mean, a smart car. Lane departure warning. So you, if you, you know, drift into another lane, it lets you know. Lane centering feature using onboard cameras. The car knows where you are. Things like workload information management. What does that mean? Well, the idea is during, during stressful moments when the traffic or the weather conditions are bad, um, and the road condition is bad, that it kind of sets feature priorities. It, you know how now when you're driving, you can't do, there's some things you can't do. You can't pair a phone to the car until you're parked. This is going to enhance this. When you get in driving conditions where you need to focus, the Ford will actually tell you, and you know what, we're not going to let you do that right now. You should be <laughs> you should be paying attention. That They're calling that uh, workload information management. They've done a lot of research on the cognitive ability of the human brain. It's very cool, very cool stuff. They will be using the cloud. And then this Ford Social. So I want to show you this new site. This is social.ford.com. Ford Social. And people are going in there and they're putting in their ideas. You go to the Your Ideas section for things they'd like to see in their new Fords. And their categories, convenience, green, infotainment, performance, personalization. Here's some interesting ideas. Wi-Fi music sharing between Fords. How do you like that? <laughs> You're, yeah, I love that idea. Uh, a 15-year-old submitted, let's go back here to uh, green. A 15-year-old had a great idea, biodiesel hybrid. Very clever stuff. I want you to participate over here. Automatic sunscreens and... To uh, key in when the sun's too bright. A wind turbine under the hood to charge the lithium battery. Just love this stuff. Interior design ideas. Recharge with so I like this. Recharge with solar. Solar panel incorporated into the Ford Focus to help charge the battery. And you can vote. Thumbs up. I like that one. Oh, I got to log in here. I'll do that in a second. Thumbs up, thumbs down. This is social.ford.com. You're a tech geek, and Ford has asked us to reach out to you. Anybody who watches this show is kind of a geek compared to the real world. They really want your inputs. Like your favorite ideas. Do that thumbs up. Check it out. Add some ideas. And uh, get your tech geek badge. And I wrote a little bit about my uh, call with Jim Butchkowski on there. Social. You can read my little post here. Yeah, let's see if I can find it, actually. Technologies. Hey, let's see. Where is it? Here it is. Got my face on it. We talk a little bit about that conversation. It was fun. Really fun. Social.ford.com. Check it out. We thank Ford for their support of the Tech Guy program. <laughs> Dr. Mom, you have a pole dancing outfit? Wow. Wow. Padre SJ also has a pole dancing outfit. 
<laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Love that. Uh, we were, uh, let's see. Did we talk to Jerry in uh, Bristol, Florida? Did we get a chance to talk to him? Or did I, I think, I, did I put him on hold? Maybe I put him on hold. Hi, Jerry, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Hey, I guess I, I started talking to you. That's right. And uh, and then I had to take a break. I apologize. Yeah. What can I do for you? Thanks for taking my call. Sure. I've been having some virus problems. I want to know if I, I'm, I got an antivirus on my computer. Mm-hmm. What kind do you have? Yeah, they keep wanting to take it over. Is anything I can put on there to stop that? Uh, what do you have right now? I got a Viper, antivirus, anti-spyware. Hmm. Um, well, I, you know, disclaimer, this is an advertiser, but it is the vi- antivirus I recommend even if they weren't an advertiser. It's called Nod32. It's from ESET.com. I would take Viper off. Uh, because you can't have more than one antivirus on there at a time. So uninstall Viper, which is not very good, and uh, put ESET on there. They have Mac and they have Windows. Obviously, you're going to want the Windows version. It's called Nod32. And and, and I, th- you know, I think that the 30-day trial would be a good way to give you an idea of how it works. It is the best security I know of. I really like it. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I know it just completely not just Viper out. Yeah, I'm not, you know... Get Nod32. <laughs> I think that's the simplest thing to say. I do have to give a disclaimer. They're an advertiser. Uh, so you could take that with a grain of salt. If you want a free antivirus, um, I think the best free antivirus is uh, Microsoft's own, the Security Essentials program. But it's not perfect. It's not as fast and so forth. Viper is a, a paid product, V-I-P-R-E. I don't, I don't have anything particularly against it. Um, I don't hear very many good things about it, however. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, if you're unhappy with it, then check out ESET. E-S-E-T uh, dot com. And there are a lot of free antiviruses. I, I have to say I'm not a fond of uh, AVG or Avast. I really, if you're going to get a, if you don't want to spend money on a virus, which I think is probably a foolish form of thrift, but if you don't want to, I understand people don't want to spend money on that stuff. At least put Microsoft Security Essentials on there. Uh, Greg is in San Diego. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Greg. Hello, Leo Laporte. Got a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to add to the beauty of my Roku and put uh, live uh, local television on. Is there a way to do that? So would I. So let me... (laughs) And you can't. So Roku, I love Roku. Uh, oh, Roku is a little tiny box about the size of a hockey puck, uh, although a little square, that has an HDMI connector, so you connect it right up to your TV, and an, and an Ethernet or Wi-Fi adapter, and so you connect up to your Internet. And it, what it does is it takes any television, and ma- any HD TV, and makes it a Internet-connected TV. And Roku, you know, they've got all sorts of st- podcasts. They've got Amazon. They've got... The only thing they don't have is iTunes. You know, they're competing with the Apple TV, similar idea, but Apple has iTunes, Roku doesn't. But it has everything else. In fact, I've got a great place for you to go. It's called Roku-Channels.com. It's the unofficial Roku channel database. You know, you can see all the stuff at the Roku channel store and all that. But, you know, Netflix. And, but if you look at this, there's over a thousand kind of hidden channels. Okay. So not all of these are accessible. But, it, for instance, I like Australian rules football, footy. Okay. There's a footy channel. Now, they don't show that. You won't might not know about that, but this, this channel guide will show you. But I agree with you. The big problem to, cable, to cord cutting, which is what you want to do, you want to get rid of your cable subscription or your satellite subscription. No, I, found company, I found a company that's operated in New York City. Aereo. Now, Aereo is really interesting. And they make deals with the uh, local television stations. Aereo is so bizarre. This is Barry Diller's company. Barry Diller is... Uh, was famous as like the super Hollywood agent. Aereo is right now only available in New York, but it will be available, I'm sure, elsewhere. And yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see it on Roku. But you know what they do that's so weird? What's that? Court, the courts, the, everybody's trying to shut them down. The courts ruled it's legal. 
because every Aereo subscriber has his or her own personal little tiny antenna. So <laughs> the idea is, you know, the way a cable company works, you got a big antenna and everybody's hooked up to that one. Okay. But the way Aereo works is you can watch local channels. The locals hated this. You can watch local channels because basically all you're doing is renting an antenna in New York and it's connected directly to you. They tried to put them out of business and they won in court. But it is not yet available everywhere. I don't know if you can get it in San Diego. A R A E R E O dot com. Very interesting. Small. Small enough that hundreds That's the of antenna. can fit in a single room where you can access them from the internet and watch live broadcast TV as it airs. Pick and choose the TV you want. You can even record that live TV and play it back, like a DVR without the box. Live broadcast TV. You can see why they're the upset. Air, wherever you are, whenever you want. Aerial, available exclusively in New York City. There's the bottom line. Available exclusively in New York City. And that's right now. I think they didn't want... TV. I didn't think they want the court air, cases all antenna, over the dish, world. Cable, that was, I think, what happened. <laughs> they just didn't want to deal with that. If you could get a, let's see, watch, check my location. Looks like you have denied your browser's request to share. <laughs> so I guess I have to turn on location checking. Dr. Mom, do you have area? You can get CNN. You can get a lot of stuff. Yeah, iPlayer is a good solution. Oh, so it's New York City City. I mean, you can't even get it in Long Island. Oh, uh, that's too bad. It's less of interest in New York City since you can, in fact, get... Probably get all the channels via antenna anyway. What do you think, Richard? Yeah. Yeah, I love that idea. The e-recording. The clock that a lot of people have on their Mac desktop. My funky driver, are you talking about my clock here? This bottom clock? Really like this. This is a, um, it's not free, but it's a Mac app called iClock. What is it called? iClock? Yeah, iClock Pro. Um, and it gives you all sorts of things, but these are the floating clocks. You can also have floating calculator, big calendar stopwatch. I use the stopwatch to record stuff, so it's got this nice little stopwatch. iClock Pro. It's really cool. And it does some interesting things. So you see, I have all these other times in my... Um, it adds three menu items. Let's go up here and I'll show you. So one menu item shows you time zones, but also you can set alarms so forth. This has this this menu. Oops, it's off the screen. Which opens a calendar, mini calendar. I find that handy. And then um, it also shows you running apps. Let's take a. Look. So um, these are, here's all the open apps, and you can access fast access system preferences, menu extras, recent apps, lots of stuff. So it's called iClock Pro. And uh, it's not free, though. I can't remember how much it is, but it's a good little Mac app. It's from PlumAmazing.com. So it's handy for me because I'm always saying what, you know, different time zones. So I've got Pacific, Mountain, Central, Eastern, and Zulu. So it's, you know, it's 834 Zulu. Or I, UTC. Now, Aereo is very different. It's a service. It's very different. I would love to see Aereo on Roku. I don't know if that'll ever happen. That's an interesting idea. Oh, let me look at my funky design. My funky design? Let me check that out. Ah. 
That's nice. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. We're talking about tech of all kinds. Anything you're interested in, you give me a ring. 888-827-5536. Bob is in Mansfield, Ohio. Our next caller. Hey, Bob, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Thanks, Leo, for taking my call. I really enjoy your show. Thank you. I've got a disc dilemma. What I've been doing, I've been burning photos to a disc of a car that I'm restoring, and I went to burn some photos to it. There was no problem. They burnt to the disc, and it was a few days later uh, I had went to you know burn some more photos to the disc, and the computer refuses to open the disc, even to look at the pictures. You can't burn nothing you know, on the disc, and I even tried the disc on a different computer. And I don't know what happened, and the disc is only probably not even half used. And I've got a lot of photos on there that, uh, you know, as a progression of the works being done on the car and some reference fo- photos, you know, for reassembly, and I'm just afraid that maybe they're gone. So how do you burn the disc? Do you have a program that burns it all at once, disc at once, or do you drag files over to the disc? What I, what I do when I, when I take the pictures, then I go. Uh, now, on the computer, it had uh, uh, Windows Photo Gallery. Yeah. So what I would do is I would click on that, then I would go to File, then it would say Import, uh, you know, from your camera or, you know, video or whatever. Then after I would, you know, download them to the computer, then I would go to the pictures section. I would open that up in each set of pictures that I would add to to the computer. I would uh, title them, you know, so that I know exactly what's in that folder. So I would highlight when I would go to pictures, I would highlight that folder. Once it was highlighted, then I would hit the burn button. And, and so I, that's in that's in the Windows Photo Album program. You'd burn it from there. Uh, well, no, that's that's. Uh, that's Where's the just, burn button? Who's burn button? The burn button. Well, there is one on top of the Windows Photo Gallery, but then I don't burn in that section. I go to my pictures. I close out. Ah, uh, you're Windows. doing it from Windows Seven. Yes. Got it. Um, and, yeah, you got a bad disk. So the only, <laughs> sorry, the only uh, hope I had was that perhaps you were using, there's two ways you can burn a CD. One is disc at once where you burn the whole thing. It's done. You can't add to it. If you can add to a CD later uh, or you're dragging and dropping files, you're using a different kind of disc burning using something called UDF. You'd have to have a special driver to read those discs or make them. And if you want to look at discs that are created that way, you need to finalize the disk before you take it out of the drive. Otherwise, no other computer. The only computers that can read it will be ones with UDF drivers. So I don't, th- I don't know if you're, if it's UDF. If you're progressively adding, uh, I think you're using Windows Burner itself. That would be my best guess, unless you installed some other software. Um, a, because you've put something on a disk, does not mean you have a backup. One copy of something is as good as nothing. It's not backed up unless you have two or more. In fact, I would suggest three if you care about it. So if what you've been doing is copying it to CD and erasing the originals, this was inevitable. CDs don't always work. You know, I don't know if you have a verify setting in your burn capability, but if you verify it, that helps. But CDs still die. It's, it, CDs are not a perfect form of storage. Uh, they can wear out. They can, if exposed to sunlight, they can corrode. If exposed to moisture, these things are not reliable. So I certainly hope that you have another copy. If that was your only copy, then you made a kind of a mistake. You 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 assumed you had a backup when you didn't. Please, please make backups. And my your best bet would be. And I talk about this all the time, the 3 two, one backup. And this is created by a guy who's an expert in digital asset management. In fact, he wrote a book called The Damn Book, D-A-M Book, that is all about this. He has a great website that he did with the Association of Professional Photographers and the Library of Congress. It's called DP, short for digital photography, dpbestflow.org. And he, he, Peter, this guy's named Peter Krogh. He coined the term 3 two, one backup. I've mentioned it before. Keep Burn this into your mind, folks. 
This, if you, and photographers, you know, look, you take a picture of a wedding. If you take photos of a wedding, you get a paid job. They are not going to have that wedding again if you lose those pictures. If you lose those pictures, you will never work as a wedding photography again. And you're going to have a bridezilla hammering on your door at 3 in the morning. You cannot afford to lose those pictures, right? So look at photographers. Think about this a lot. And so Peter says three copies of anything. My friend Alex Lindsay says one copy of anything is none at all. You might as well just throw it out. You don't have a backup. You're just flirting with disaster. Three copies of every anything. Two different forms of media. Don't just trust CDs. They're not that reliable. Don't trust zip disks or floppies. Two different copies. Maybe one on hard drive, one in the cloud. Something like that. And one off-site. That's really important. I don't care if you have a hard drive that you copy and you carry it over to mom's house or you bring it to work. But <laughs> it doesn't have to be the Internet. But off-site means not in the same place the originals are. And that's in case there's really a disaster, a fire, a flood, or a tornado or something, and, the, and, and all the... You know, everything's lost. At least you have a copy somewhere else. And if mom's house is next door, I'd bring it farther away. That's why I like internet backup because it's, I mean, it really is safe out there. So I'm a little nervous. Uh, uh, I hope that's not your only copy, Bob. Um, you've tried it on other machines. CDs fail. It could be, a, could have been a bad blank disc. It could be something went wrong with the writer. Um, CDs fail. And so if that was your only copy, I'm so sorry. There is no such thing as a CD recovery service. If you cannot see that CD, it's gone. Junk it. And, uh, you should, so a couple of pieces of advice, do not erase the original just because you've put it on a CD. That's crazy, crazy talk. Check that CD on another machine before you even trust it. Make sure it got burned. I would, you know, you're on Windows 7, use SkyDrive. Put it on SkyDrive. Put it on uh, Windows uh, Photo Gallery, Windows Live Photo Gallery. I would highly recommend it. Now, speaking of Aereo, Dr. Mom, who lives in Long Island, you know, Aereo, we were talking about last uh, break, is New York City only right now. But if you are in New York City, try Aereo, and it, it will tie to your Roku. Now, this is cool. You can create a Roku private channel that you can see Aereo on. Now, this is huge because it means if Aereo ever becomes nationwide, it'll be a boon for cord cutters because essentially your Roku will now get local television as well as all the other things, Netflix and Amazon and all that. This is, this is, this is exciting. I hope Aereo succeeds. And you, can, you better believe the local channels are trying to clobber it. They sued... They sued like crazy. This is free over-the-air TV. And you know how they get around the whole issue? They just say, well, no, you're renting an antenna. <laughs> it's just it's just off-site, and so you connect via the Internet. But you have your own personal antenna. They're about as big as a dime. They're tiny. Oh, it's gonna it's just going to change everything if this succeeds. And I'm rooting for them. Mike in Los Angeles, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Mike. Hi, how you doing? Great. How are you? Hello. Yeah, I, I hear you great. What can I do for you? Okay, great. I have a Droid X from Verizon, a Motorola Droid X. It's my only phone. It's my only computer. It's effectively my TiVo through an app. Um, I love the apps. I hate the phone. It's awful for a lot of reasons. I won't bother you with. Um, what I'm thinking well, hang, doing hang on. I'll give you some buying advice, but we've got to take a break. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's get Dicky D on the line. Gonna get Dicky D on the line, connect to Skype via VNC, and then I'm gonna hang up that one, and I'm gonna make it's a, a crazy call world we live in. One. And more than any question I get asked is, and I'm on how do a I video get video call <laughs> Dicky D protection from spy? And I'm gonna see how Dicky D is doing. Hello, Dicky D. Hello, Dicky D. Come in. Hello, Dicky D. Come in, Dickie D. Are you there? Say something. Hello, hello. Hello, muscly arms. How are you? Good. Oh, good. Let's just hide my video. There we go. Now he's there. 
call 866-93. What's happening? Here we are. Okay. And don't forget to like this. Oh, hey, I just met I you. Say, you aged a lot in one yeah, week. Yeah, I did. <laughs> is, is, is Herbert the pervert? Hello. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've been writing you. And you <laughs> well, I never hear. Ignoring. You never call. You never write. No, I call a lot. No. It makes me sad. <laughs> he whistles <laughs> when, he, when he talks. That's I think a his great den- voice. His dentures are damaged. <laughs> sort of. It's, yeah, uh, it's I got, a family I, guy. You know, I got mine through the mail. Yeah. Yeah. They're the best. Yeah, they're made out of cherry wood. Yeah. Yeah. You can just, and they come with a file. You can customize them. Oh, it's so great. So you got to try this Oreo thing. You're in, uh, you're in uh, New York. Yeah. Have you ever, Oreo, have you ever tried it? I have not. The, the one thing, Time Warner is finally doing something for their customers. Uh, parts of New York are wired for Wi-Fi, including wow. the marina at 79th Street. And if you're a, Oh, so we can watch your boat via Wi-Fi. Yes, uh, for free, as long as you're a customer. Uh, and I think a couple, of, I think Optiman's doing it, Time Warner's doing it. So you just sign in. You have to sign in with your own ID, but then you have free That's Wi-Fi. That's cool. Yeah. I like that. That's great. I see. Hello, Myra. Myra Joyce is in there. Yeah. Put your yeah. head in. We're just talking oh, to you. Hi. Hi. What you doing, Myra? Hi. I'm sorry. Hi, Leo. Hey. No, that's not Leo. That's... That's Herbert the pervert. Oh. <laughs> Hi, my slips. I wonder, can you find the dollar bill I strapped to my thigh? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wait a minute. Myra's got two screens going. She's, she's really fancy. What are you, knitting? What are you doing there? Oh, those are your headphones. Okay. She's uh, eating her snacky things from Dennis. Dennis brings down the snacks. The snacks. Oh, he's really nice. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if he'd like to come visit me. I could I give think... him a special place in the basement. I bet you could. I could. Not keeping Dennis here. I'll starve to death. Oh. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> that's your best voice yet. Oh, that's cool, Dr. Mom. I like it. I like it. <whistles> Let's try it. Do you think it'll work? They're probably checking. All right, Leo Carbonite, your last live read. But here's my number. <laughs> so call me maybe. Oh. It's hard to look right yeah. at you, maybe. Oh. But here's my number. <laughs> so call, call me maybe. Ah, uh, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> Make it stop. 8888 Ask Leo. Actually, this is the waning moments of the Tech Guy show. We're almost running out of time here. I have to uh, quickly get Mac, Mike back on the line. He has a Droid X. Hi. And he yeah. wants to get, he wants to replace it because it's his one computer. He says, I don't need it to be my phone. I could have a dumb phone and have a tablet computer. Right. What do you do? What do you do with, uh, with the computer side? Email, surfing, that kind of thing? Yeah, that's it. Right. Uh, highly recommend. Here's what I would recommend. Since you're already in, in the Android space and you're comfortable with it, do you have? Right. Oh, but here's an issue. Do you have Wi-Fi? What kind of internet connectivity do you have? Uh, I don't have anything actually. Uh, okay, I was I, gonna recommend the Nexus Seven from Google. It's two hundred bucks, but it doesn't have. It needs Wi-Fi. Yeah, I can't use it. So in this case, I think an iPad would be a great choice. But make sure you get it. With the built-in Verizon or AT and T internet, now you're going to have to pay an extra uh, twenty-five or thirty bucks a month for that internet access. Okay, well, that's cheaper than paying now. Absolutely, and uh, then you can have a dumb phone 
full internet access and a much nicer screen. I think the iPad is a very good choice for somebody like you. I, if you, I want to stay with an Android pad because I like the apps. Yeah. Uh, there's some good Android choices. If you don't mind spending some money, the, my favorite Android uh, tablet is the Asus um, uh, Transformer Infinity. It's a tablet that you can dock with a keyboard and gives you really, in effect, a laptop. It's very nice. I also recommend the Samsung Galaxy Tab. They make a 7 and a 10. But again, you've got to get one with 3G built in or you'll have no internet. internet. Right. Okay. And one more question. Sure. Um, I ran into somebody that bought a box at a kiosk in a mall, but I forgot to write down what it was. Um, but for 50 bucks a month flat, it was his, his Wi-Fi hotspot and a 3G and everything and unlimited. Yeah. Can you yeah. What that is? yeah, it's probably from Virgin Mobile. They, okay. they tend to have those little mall kiosks, and they have the only, as far as I know, the only flat rate, three G data data thing. It looks it's called a MiFi, looks like a credit card, and it has okay. it it it's a Wi Fi access spot that gets its data from three G from the Kissel network, and uh, Virgin Virgin Mobile sells one that is using the Sprint network that is, I believe, unlimited data. I think that's the last one. And it'll work. With, that's a separate little box that works with any of the tablets. Yeah, so you could then get it. Yeah, you know, there you go. Now, get a Nexus 7, which is 200 bucks, and it's fantastic. Oh, if I have that, then use the next combined Yeah. Network. worry about 3G. Yeah. All right. I'm there, now that. you're cooking with gas. But Nexus doesn't have an SD card, right? It does not, but you don't need a lot of storage because most of what your content is uh, is stored online. If you want one with an SD card, then the Samsung Galaxy Tab. Okay, great. Thank you, Leo. You're welcome. I think that's a great idea. Hey, look who's here. It's Dick D. Bartolo, Mad Magazine's maddest writer and the Gizwiz. I'm such a fan of yours. Welcome. Well, I am a fan of yours. Oh, wow. So we don't have to do anything but compliment each other. Yeah, let's just spend the rest of the show doing that. What do you say? Well, no. You were saying to that gentleman that he will be cooking with gas. <laughs> well, I have something that you can cook with electric. Uh-huh. We both like retro gadgets. So this is kind of fun, okay? It is the Red Retro Pop-Up. Hot dog toaster. <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay, tell yeah. me this again. It toasts your hot dogs. You, and your buns. And your buns. At the same time. So you stick two weenies in the little hot dog holes. What if you only have one weenie? Uh, then you're out of luck. I've got two buns. Yeah. Okay, you have to invite a friend over and tell him to bring his weenie. But okay. You should be aware that uh, in checking all the reviews, you have to use very small Franks because Franks expand as they cook. And a lot of people online were saying, well, wait a minute, I could not get the Franks out. Now, I know they give you two little uh, thongs with it so you can. There's pull thongs them out. involved? Yeah. So you put the buns in the wide slot. You put the weenies in the little round hole slot, push it down, and in theory, they pop up together. Why does it sound like a sex ed class all of a sudden? <laughs> so it's a, now I you you you, you right. said you read the reviews. Some of these some people say it does it cooks the buns uh, too little or the hot dog too much. Yes, or, yes. It, it, the instructions say specifically that they have to be small hot dogs. That they have to be room temperature hot dogs. And Leo, it's easy. I, I read probably fifty or sixty reviews. This is how it splits down almost without question. Parents with kids love it. Yeah. Because my guess is yeah. they say to the kids, kids oh, don't go care. make your own dinner. Yeah, kids the don't kid, care. They'll eat raw care? hot dogs and give them half a chance. I was going to say exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. as long as two things pop up, they'll put them together and it'll taste good. Right. Uh, but if you're a... <laughs> Just put lots of ketchup like on it. Your, yeah. If you like your Franks and uh, buns, a very specific temperature and well done this, you may not like this device or have to use it uh, several cycles to get it the way you want. But... It's nineteen bucks on Amazon. Well, that's good. So yeah, yeah so you can't go wrong. I should. Well, you could go wrong, but get your money back. <laughs> you could definitely go wrong. <laughs> I'm going to call my friend Frank and tell him to bring his buns and wieners over here, and yeah, we're going to exactly. try it. We're yeah, going to try exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. Just don't get it <laughs> stuck in there. <laughs> Dee Bartolo is Mad Magazine's maddest writer, 
Uh, and we call him the Gizwiz. You can find him online at gizwiz.biz. And uh, that's where you'll get a chance to play the what the heck is that game. Uh, a close-up picture of some gadget or item that you can, uh, if you guess it right, you get an yeah. autographed copy of magazine. Guess it wrong, you get an autographed copy of Mad Magazine. So you really, it's one of those games yeah. that's hard to lose. You'll be winning the new issue that is Look not that. out yet, but that's cover. That's good. That's very timely. You've got Alfred E. Newman. And uh, two devils. Normally, it's an <laughs> angel and devil. This time, it's two devils on his shoulder. On his left shoulder, the president, Barack Obama. On his right shoulder, the Republican nominee, or I guess he's not yet, but the potential Republican nominee, Mitt Romney. Both of them yeah. whispering in his ear. Exactly. Tough choice. <laughs> Dick, thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, hang in there. We do a little thing with Dick after the show. He's going to stick around and answer your chat room questions and so forth. Yeah. Tiff, Redding, Pennsylvania. Hi, Tiff. Hello, Leo. This is Tiff from Redding, Good to also talk to you. known as Robert Horn to all these unwanted callers I'm getting. Oh, you're smart. You have a fake name. No, they're calling me saying I'm pre-approved for a $1,500 oh, my, it's loan. It's spam. To them that it's a new cell phone number. Uh, not oh. to call me that it must have been the, the person who had this number. And they're still ignoring you. Number. Wow. So they still keep calling. I've been getting unwanted calls for six days in a row now, every five minutes. <sighs> That's terrible. Are you there? Now, a lot of people are having this problem. I'm on disability, and I get a free uh, Kyocera. It's just a simple phone, no camera or nothing, with uh, 250 free minutes and text. On the same day, I get my Social Security each month. Oh, that's terrible. Now, so they're using up your minutes. They can't do anything to prevent all these unwanted callers except to change my number. And I don't want to keep changing my number because then I have to change it with all my friends. Well, you family. shouldn't have to change it more than once, Tiff. I don't. Th I think the problem is that this number, well, you know, it's illegal to do what they're doing. By the way, the FTC, the FTC uh, has, you know, says if you say do not call me, they're not supposed to call you. They're out of the country. They don't care. Let me think about an answer. I'll have to take your uh, answer on advisement. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, out of time. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. I'm Leo Laporte. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, the Tech Guy is just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows now on the Twit Netcast Network, and you'll find them all at twit.tv. We talk about Windows and Windows Weekly, Macintosh and MacBreak Weekly, iPad on iPad Today. You get your daily dose of tech news from Tech News Today and our weekly roundtable show This Week in Tech. It's all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next time with another great Tech Guy podcast. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.